welcome to the City Council FY 2013 budget hearings. Uh, I'm Councilor Bill Dwight, the Council President. I'll be presiding over this hearing. Okay. Uh, uh, tonight we have a, a full agenda. The meeting will go, it's scheduled to go for four hours. So buckle up. Here we go. Uh, we'll, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of the, what should we do for, is there anything else I should announce? All right, let's get right to it. Um, uh, Steve Connor is here from Veteran Services. Did the roll uh, call? What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to do a roll call. There we go. Thank you. I knew there was something else. <laughs> Thank Councilor you. Councilor Adams? Here. Councilor Carney? Present. Councilor Dwight? Here. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Here. Councilor Labarge? Present. Councilor Spector? Here. Councilor Schwartz? Here. Okay. All right, now Steve Connor. Good afternoon. Were you expecting to me make a statement? That... If, if you want, if you want to make just an opening statement, just uh, to um, flesh out, you know, hit on the highlights. <laughs> maybe an inappropriate use of the word, but uh, of, of uh, well, actually, um, I would start by saying, as far as the budget is concerned, we are appear to be leveling out. Um, for those who have been on the ride with me for the last eight years, you'll notice that we kept doing this. Well, we are finally doing that. So uh, in that way, that's good news. I think we still have the outreach going. Um, I got a phone call from Northern New, Ham uh, New Hampshire, yeah, Northern New Hampshire the other day, um, calling me up, asking me about benefits, and I said, I really, I only have eight towns. I don't go as far as New Hampshire, but <laughs> thanks for calling. Um, so our outreach is working. I'm not sure why it's in New Hampshire, but it's working. Um, and so we continue to do that. We are trying to um, formalize our work online through our Facebook page and our um, website. The one drawback is, is that I have that being done by some of our more talented college students and one of my better ones just recently left and she is now working, has a full-time job and is graduating from Hampshire College. So I have to now train somebody new and go through all of that again. So, um, but those are kind of the high points of, you know, finally stabling out and uh, our office is staying good. As it says in the budget, we have some initiatives we're working hard on. And uh, Steve, could, could you expand, explain, for, particularly for folks who are just tuning in, when you're describing leveling out, I mean, part of the, uh, I, I know from serving on the Veterans Affairs Committee, along with the Chair Council with us and Council Tacey, that what you're describing is your outreach actually, the success has generated uh, a lot of response and let a number of veterans know that the, these uh, these funds and services are available to them where they might not otherwise have been aware. So your success actually translates as a larger payout right. ultimately. Right. And when you're saying you're leveling out, you've, you've achieved a saturation point. Of that, that is, yeah, that's kind of the belief that we have reached out to a lot of, especially the senior population, um, the World War II and Korean War veterans and or their surviving spouses. We've worked hard to do outreach to all those folks that might have some financial um, difficulty. Um, it doesn't mean that they're broke, but you know that um, they might need some, uh, some help. And our program is intended to help those very people that um, with medical expenses and things like that. So when I say level out, I guess I'm looking at it as we have done a good job. I don't think we've reached everybody, but um, <laughs> I know that most people in uh, the city of Northampton knows about our office. <laughs> and I had given a statistic, and I think it still holds true for the next, for these last six months, that we um, provide services and assistance to nine, almost nine out of every um, 1,000 citizens in Northampton. That doesn't mean one out of a uh, nine out of 1,000 veterans. That's nine out of 1,000 citizens. So we have the highest caseload in the state. So when I say 
I there may be some more people out there, but I never see us climbing like I, we did the first seven years that I was on. Councilor Adams, did you have a question? <clears throat> yeah, I had a question about um, well, if it, it's, it's leveling out. You, you, you're telling us so, but I'm looking at the five-year trend. It looks like it's going up and down. Last year, I mean, last year was just over six hundred thousand. This one's right around eight hundred thousand. So for the for the whole department. So could you explain that? I mean, when you say leveling out, you, I guess it sounds like you mean. Um, On the if you're looking at the chart, the five-year trend. Yes. Yes. Um, I was confused by that as well. The under FY 2012, that is um, what was actually budgeted for, not what we actually are spending. So our whole department is going to spend about the same amount as last year, uh, maybe maybe a little under. Um, but yeah, and we project next year to be the Thanks, same. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I'll talk a little more about your use of interns. Um, how long have you been doing that? And I ask you that just because I think it's a resource um, that I'm not sure many other departments um, take good advantage of. So, Well, for mine, it's a unique situation. The Anybody who's going to college on the GI Bill, mm -hmm. that includes even dependents who are going to college on the GI Bill, their fathers or mothers, um, are allowed to do work study. And those work study students can work either at the VA hospital, soldiers' home, or in a veteran service office because their job is doing VA outreach and assisting with information referral. So I have them work in my office. Um, they work at answering phones, connecting people up. And as a matter of fact, if we and we do get people who come in and want to go back to college themselves or they're returning veterans and they come to our office to figure out what their educational benefits are. I have a good general idea of it. I don't have the specifics. I don't know the forms off the top of my head. I leave that to them. So somebody walks in, I just say, oh, one of them, yeah, that'll help you. So they're able to do things like that and do some projects as long as it's involving outreach and things So is this like a that. paid internship paid right, by the- they get paid by the VA. Oh, by the VA. Yes, the VA okay. pays them and I don't. Okay. So that's why they're such a good it's resource. It's federal. <laughs> yes, the federal government. And it's while they're in school, they're allowed to work so many hours and they work them in our office. And typically, have these been veterans or? Yes. Oh. Yeah. As I finally have, this past year, have gotten two people on within the district who are the de dependents going to school because the father, in this case, both fathers re enlisted and are making a career of it. And if you did that, you can s turn your GI Bill over to your dependents, which is what they did. Okay, that's great. And the reason, just for uh, the, my colleagues, the reason I asked that too is because I just found out that um, Smith College provides for every student one, at least one semester of a paid internship anywhere. Not anywhere, but I mean, you, uh, certainly a nonprofit like the city of Northampton, you know, might be a good prospect for folks and maybe if there are ways to communicate that maybe work with the mayor or somebody find some opportunities to uh, tie into the resources we have there for students who might be interested in municipal government or um, otherwise you know make a good, good person to reach out to as well is um, his name is John Riff and he is at the University of Massachusetts he he runs the community service learning right. program for uh, he might, he doesn't do all five colleges, but he's connected with the five college system mm. as well. And so he's got students all the time that are looking for work. And so that would be also a great place, great resource for them. Okay, thanks. Council LaBarge. Thank you. Steve, um, going through your budget, there was an increase of uh, 185,716 in the veterans budget, which was to fund your veterans benefits at the level of the actual expenditure, rather than supplement with free cash at the rate of 75%. And could you explain that? Okay, yes. Um, when I, early on in the budgets, as it grew, and we 
had no idea what it was going to grow to, was going to stay high, was going to drop. When it was unsure, it used to be I was allotted a certain amount of money, and then I would come back to you folks two, three times a year and say, I need more money out of free cash to provide these benefits. Um, but now we're getting our 75% back from the state, <laughs> and it's kind of catching up to the level of our expenditure. In other words, we used to, if, if I had spent $500,000 out in benefits, but the year before, I only paid out 350000 Seventy-five percent of that coming back into the general fund wasn't as much as I was expending out that year. But now that we're kind of leveling out, the projection was to let's do what we're really going to spend, very close to it. And that way, as the 75 percent comes back into the general fund, it, we've kind of caught up. So I don't have the lag of the year that we used to have as we were growing. Now we're leveling out more. How many hours a week do you work, Steve? On here, am I reading this correctly? It's five hours? That's what I'm, yes. And we have a secretary, department secretary, at 40 hours. Correct. OK, can you explain how come you're at 35 and she's at 40 hours a week? And what is the need here A 40 hours a week for her and 35 for you? For me, supervising the staff and doing the um, work that I do, I am not the person that files all that paperwork, gets all the things to the state, works with the auditors and the treasurer's office to make sure that all that we've put out, we're getting our 75% back, or in some cases, 100% back. So um, I have given that over to our department secretary, Rebecca. Um, now that we have a district, and we do that for eight towns, she does it for all of the towns, um, with the exception of maybe <laughs> Amherst, which I kind of handle myself, because there's just not enough time in the day for her to do all of it. But she needed the 40 hours because she does all the reporting and she works with all the treasurers on each town to make sure it goes out. And of course, the city of Northampton has the busiest office. So, you know, that's why she's at 40 and I'm, you know, at the regular 35. I had asked for that last year just because of the district and all of the additional things. Right. And that I would coming. call that, but I think because we are doing a budget hearing, that the residents in the city should know exactly because this is on the web right and we're the ones that have to answer just in case right. there's any questions and yeah. I know what's going on with it right. and I also know like with Rebecca yes okay she received an outstanding veterans award maybe you could talk about that for a minute please yes every year the state um, for the last four or five years has been doing an annual training to make sure that we're up to date on and the new things that happen and that new VSOs who are coming in learn what needs to be done. Uh, you can't learn it in one week, but we do go to the week's training. We went to it the first week of March this year out in Lemonster and the I walked in the first day and they said, can you give us a little bio information on your assistant Rebecca? And I said, sure, why? And they said, well, don't tell her yet, but at the annual banquet, the secretary has decided to make her the administrative assistant of the, of the year for the state of Massachusetts. So that was really, I was very proud. And I probably gave them too much of a bio. They cut it down. But yeah, so she uh, this year got the award for the outstanding um, veteran service officer assistant in the whole state. Okay. And it wasn't my decision. It was theirs. Okay. I'd like a breakdown on the burial expenses at $12,000. And I'd like to have a figure of how many we had in 2012 already. Because I know you had stated it was $2,000 per burial, right? right? So out of the $12,000, how much now have we used? My belief is we went over the 12000 that we had budgeted this year because I did lose some of my veterans. But I didn't study my actual numbers before I came over here on, on, on the burial benefits. But basically it is, if a veteran, an indigent veteran passes away in any of the eight towns, 
uh, we, well, I should just say the city of Northampton because that's only the city of Northampton's budget. But if they have passed away and there's no family and there's no money, then under the law, Chapter 115, I'm supposed to provide for a um, dignified burial of a veteran. And so in this year, we did have, um, I think we are on either seven or eight of our folks have passed away and had no resources to pay for that. It, we can give up to $2,000. It's not always $2,000. Sometimes family want very private things or if there's nobody even left behind, um, they don't want anything other than either a burial or a cremation. And often we bring them to um, either Agawam or Wichington cemeteries, the veteran Have you cemeteries. Have gone over the $12,000? That's my question. I think this year we are going over it, yes, for the first yeah. time. Where do we get the money for that? Where do I, you take it from? I will take it from our veterans' benefits if I have anything left over. And I think we projected that last time I got a little influx that we will be all right with that additional. And the veterans' food benefits at $900. In the year of 2010, you spent what? Was it $800? Probably. In the year of 2011, you did not use it. In the year of 2012, you did not use it so far, right? Correct. Um, one of the, that benefit line um, was kind of an emergency uh, opportunity for people to get food on a very short term, you know, like I can write them the voucher, they can get it today, rather than waiting for the regular process of getting a check issued. Uh, I guess I'm surprised I didn't spend any last year. I don't think I've done any this year. Um, one of the reasons is, is we're getting to be a more well-oiled machine and we're getting money to these people faster and I don't need to get them emergency food like I did in the past, but it is there in case. I also know that there are a couple of times that we needed to do emergency food and we put it through the regular system to get the 75% back and all that. So that's probably why it didn't show up. On the Veterans Medical, can you explain this? There is a percentage that we get reimbursed back from. Right. And for an example, in 2010, because I know I spent a lengthy time calling our financial director to get information to compare from year to year. In 2010, 23,000 was spent, and then 2011, which was an increase of $34,000 or so. In 2012, right, is at 28,000. Okay. Excuse me, just for a second. I think it's appropriate that we, I, I forgot to do this, we should recognize Susan Wright and the mayor just in the event that um, we want oh, them to speak to any of these issues. So if I'll, I'll entertain a motion. I'll entertain right. that motion. Okay, second. Second. All those in favor of recognizing Susan Wright and the mayor? Aye. 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 No? Staying? Aye. Thank you. Okay. So consider themselves recognized so you guys can pop up as appropriate as you feel appropriate. Hit it, Steve. Okay. <laughs> Got that question. Uh, no, oh, the medical. The medical expense. Okay. The medical expense, that is basically the. That line is, okay, no, that's separate from insurance. <laughs> so I have two medical lines. I have a medical line which pays back or reimburses the people who are on with me, my seniors, my veterans, if they have um, doctor's appointments, glasses, hearing aids, whatever it might be that they need, and they have a copay that goes with it or an outright cost. That's where that line comes from. Then I have a medical insurance line, which we have um, many of our folks who are on Medicare, they also get a Medicare supplement program, and we pay for that supplement program. So um, as far as the medical, we've had last year, was it last year or the year before, we had a large line because a large expenditure. I think Susan had told me it was like 34000 or so. Yeah. Um, we had uh, a few people have a really hard time, um, and their insurance did not 
cover all that we were hoping it would cover. So we had larger expenditures than we might on a regular basis. Right. All right. So we're up to eight. So a little less than sixteen hundred, or are we right at sixteen? We're at, at 16. sixteen. All right. So yes. Yeah, so we've had eight funerals that we have paid for burials that we've paid for this year. Yeah. So uh, I don't. It, well, what do I know? I didn't anticipate I've ever had a caseload of one hundred and seventy something people a month. So I guess anything's possible. Also, on the last, the veterans benefits other. Can you please explain that? At a thousand dollars? Yes, um, that is usually expended for an emergency or somebody who is really in need but doesn't quite fit the criteria of Chapter 115 money uh, that gets the 75% reimbursement. We don't often use it, but sometimes there are emergencies where we need to do it. So I keep it in the line, but um, I think it's been a couple of years since I've had to really. Yeah, we didn't spend any last year, and I don't think we're going to spend it this year. But there have been difficulties. I can think of one year where we had to come up with some money for someone who they didn't have their DD-214 yet. So they were technically still in, <coughs> but they needed some assistance. <clears throat> so we gave them assistance out of that money. That's not reimbursable by the state at the 75 percent. But I, that line has been there for me in case of those kind of emergencies. So there was somebody who served, but because they didn't have a discharge yet, they were still active duty. They couldn't get what they needed from the regular Department of Defense, so we kind of came to the rescue. So it's, well, that's that kind of time. I want to thank you. I want to thank Rebecca Norbert. Norbert does a tremendous amount of work in your yes, office does. as a volunteer and your other two officers and also the Veterans Council. I just think you're doing a fantastic job. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm very proud of my staff and my people. Council Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Connor, can you project? I, I, I'm sorry that I haven't been um, in the uh, Social Service and Veterans Affairs Committee, so I haven't been able to ask you this at the committee level, but can you project what the future might look like as far as regionalization goes? Do you see the budget for Northampton getting getting, you know, for, for instance, your hours or the other, or the secretary, the officer's hours getting split up differently, or is that not going to happen in the future? The district board, which is a representative <coughs> from each town, um, they would like more outreach. They would like to bring in more towns. Um, we have done the outreach. Some of those towns have a veteran service officer that's been doing it for years and years and years, and they just don't feel comfortable changing at this point in time. But I do foresee the possibility of gaining a few of the other towns within the uh, area in Hampshire County to join. I know the state <coughs> office, uh, Department of Veteran Services, has asked us, can you do this town? Can you do this town? If it gets too far out, I mean, as, as we all know, out in, in, in Boston, you know, anything outside of 495 is a wild, wild west. So I've had a call saying, do you know the guy in Middlefield? And I'm like, I don't think I know where Middlefield is. But to them, they think, you know, well, come on, it's right. You're all out there. So um, there's some towns it just doesn't make sense for us to outreach to. But there are some more local, and as their veteran service officers retire, I anticipate that they might be interested in joining the district because I think we've proven to be a very professional and um, hardworking office. And we make sure the towns get their 75% back, which in many ways is the most important part, serving your veterans but getting the money back. I will say that when we have gone into a town and taken over the services, that the monies that are paid out go up because we have very good outreach and we know how to find the folks. So if a town thinks they're going to join the district and they're going to save money, they're going to maybe save money on the process of doing things, 
but they're going to be assisting more veterans if we take over. I, I know it sounds almost arrogant, but I just know that we've done it in every single town. And all the towns that I've had have been very happy with the fact that we are now providing services for veterans that they were never able to do before. So, so just to, to so I get this straight, this office of, of four plus volunteers takes over the administration for these for those eight towns and possibly more. Right, right. So right and now Northampton is spearheading the regionalization. Right, and we are at this point at capacity what we can do with the hours that I have. Um, so any inclusion of any other town is going to need more administrative uh, assistance because I cannot drop it all on Rebecca, even though she is, you know, outstanding assistant of the year. We we would have to, if any of those towns wanted to join us in the future, I'd be going to those towns and saying, well, my budget's going to have to change and go higher because I'm going to need more staffing. But and that could happen. What it does also do is lowers it for the other communities. So our budget would go down. The North Hanson budget would right. go down as the other towns joined. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, just one quick question, Steve, about the you were hoping for 100 percent reimbursement from the governor's promise, and that the promise doesn't look like it, it's possible that it might not be realized. How does that affect your fortunes? Um, besides being sad, no, it, it was in the governor's original budget. It is in the language of the budget as it came out of the House. The Senate, I'm not sure about. We're struggling to keep the language in there. Um, I have sent out letters to all of our representatives throughout the district to encourage them to keep that in there and keep supporting the 100 percent. I know that the Department Secretary um, of Veterans Services for the state thinks that's the most fair way to do it. So I think when push comes to shove, I think it'll get through and it'll remain in the budget. Maybe that's just wishful thinking, but um, I think it will stick, come through. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. And that does matter to us because we do have both a um, homeless shelter for veterans, but we also have veterans who stay at Cot, Grove Street, and we also have a transitional program at Cherry Street. So that would matter to us in all of those places. So if I, could, if I could just make a, um, a quick note, since I've got the microphone. Um, today was kind of a sad day. We um, lost our gold star mother, yeah. uh, passed away on Friday, um, Mrs. Uh, Joanne Johnson, or Joan Johnson. Joan. I grew up. She called herself Joanne. I've known the family and I've known her. She was one of my mother's best friends. Um, she passed away on Friday. <laughs> the funeral was this morning. So um, she's the only Gold Star parent that we have in the city of Northampton at this time. And, and I guess in a way, I hope it stays that way. But she is going to be missed. And you will not see her in the Memorial Day parade. It's kind of sad. But her partner of 34 years will be in the parade. And I think he's insisting on walking. So. Uh, he's a World War II veteran, um, but uh, she's going to be sorely missed by me on a personal level, but uh, the veterans in Northampton are also going to, are very sad to see her go. But Thank you for that remembrance. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, uh, Wendy Mazza is here, city clerk. I just have a few <clears throat> handouts, if you don't mind. Sure.
thank you for inviting me, first of all. Um, to start with, um, my level funded budget would have been $259,049. Uh, um, as you can see, um, my budget has been reduced by <laughs> $31,468, which relates to a, a principal clerk's position in my office. Um, <clears throat> it now leaves the clerk, the assistant clerk, um, and two clerical staff, which staff over in the Board of Registrars. Um, the handout that I gave you is basically um, fees. I know that Susan has been updating you periodically in the council um, <clears throat> and basically you know, saying that my fees are coming in uh, below target. Um, if you look at the first analysis of the city clerk miscellaneous fees, uh, the biggest driver you're going to see is the non-criminal tickets. They're below what they were in fiscal 2010. I have absolutely no control over that. That's entirely up to the police department if the false alarms are going off or they're picking people up smoking uh, less than an ounce of marijuana. Um, then I get a ticket and they have to pay me. So that's one of the driving forces there. Um, <clears throat> business certificates, I predict that those are probably gonna come in pretty much on target um, between by the end of uh, June. And um, dog licenses, um, you know, they're a little off, but you know, the, the, the dog license late fee, but the late fee has just kicked in for May 1st, so those, those will tick up a little bit as well. Um, you can see numbers down below, um, the total number of transactions that we've done. And yes, the transactions projected are below, um, you know, what we've had in the past for fiscal 2010 and 2012. Um, and the account, uh, the account includes the following. You can see that at the top. I don't need to repeat and read everything. Um, the next one is the copies of records. Um, as you can see, the very first uh, number of vital records in Northampton, the comparison from 2008 to 2011, you can see continually that the amounts have declined. Um, and uh, you can see as well that my projection for the number of copies issued is also going to be down from 2000, fiscal 2010. In fiscal 2010, we were only charging $10 for certified copies of records. In fiscal 2011, um, we jumped it to $15 uh, per copy. So you will see there's gonna be a difference there because people are now holding on and making sure that they hold on to their record a little bit longer so they don't have to pay, continue to come and pay that $15 for a birth record or a death certificate. Um, the total amount of money that um, I expect from certified copies um, is projected. You can see the in the red, it's, it's going to be probably just about where it was for fiscal 2010. Um, 2011, it was up. I can't explain why. Um, 2000, in uh, this year, um, we've had a new program. Um, it's called the VIP program for birth records. Um, when I instantly, it's all internet based, so when I instantly register a birth, it's in real time to their community, and so they can go to their own community, and it, most of the time it costs much less than uh, for them to get a certified copy. Sometimes it's even free to them in their own community um, than coming to Northampton. So you're going to see that happen continually because they're going to be doing a new um, death program as well, which is gonna be internet based and it'll be the same way. So there's always gonna be there's always a sliding scale with, with vital records. You just, there, there's, no, there's no magic button for it. it. It depends upon how many babies are gonna be born, how many people are gonna pass away, and how many people decide that they're gonna get married. Uh, there's no prediction there. So you, you just, you know, and it's always going to be, you know, probably on the decline. Um, the next one is our license fees. Um, as you can see, um, the projected for May and June um, for, do, uh, for the, um, the uh, dog licenses, um, you can see that we have, we've licensed 1,850 dogs through April. We have 350 licenses that have not been renewed for, um, for this year. And we have 200 plus dog licenses that have never been licensed. And those are, um, those are from uh, slips from the veterinarian that they've had rabies vaccinations and we know they have a dog, but it's pretty much impossible with a, a small staff to be able to sit there and start sending out notices to over 200 plus people. Um, every one of these 300 plus have received a notice in the mail to relicense their dog. Um, I don't have the time nor the staff to go back and try to get them to come in again. Um, there was an uptick last year because I did use the Blackboard Connect to remind people 
Um, some people liked it. Some people were very annoyed with it because they thought that that was more for emergency. So I chose not to do that again this year because they were they were annoyed with it, and I didn't want David getting calls, um, you know, that they were. You know, we're using vital city resources for dog licenses, so I didn't do that. So you can see that that's where there's a little bit of um, discrepancy there as well. Um, and then the next one is um, our burial permits. Um, most city clerks are not, do not issue burial permits. Their board of health does that. Um, because our board of health's hours are not uh, conducive to uh, the uh, funeral directors and when they need a burial permit um, I was asked to take over the burial permit process because I do the death records so I've done that and you can also see that I mean you know that's another driving factor you can't there's no you can't put a dollar amount to when you know a burial permit if somebody passes away they're gonna come in and get a burial permit we're one of the highest um, in the state for issuing burial permits we paid the $35 most communities uh, are not $35 for a burial permit so um, there's no room to move for upping a burial permit at this point. Um, also, in my budget, um, you'll see that I have a, a line item for office equipment, the r &M office equipment. That's basically um, the uh, maintenance uh, for the voting machines. It usually comes in about uh, $5,100 every year for them to come and do the maintenance. They'll be here May 21st to start the maintenance for the next round of elections. Um, my election workers, it's, it's basically the people that work at the polls. And so that's a, you know, those are usually anywhere from 13,000 to 12,000 per election for um, me to staff the, the polls. Um, my printing is usually for my security paper. I have to print all my vital records on security paper. Um, so that is uh, an expense and also for my uh, mylar sleeves and binders that I put my vital records in those are expensive as well um, my ballot printing and processing is basically for printing the ballots for the, you know the election um, and coding of the machines that's the biggest piece that's very expensive is coding those those um, uh, machines and um, the, the service bureau fees are your is your code book so every time you pass an ordinance, it goes to general code for them to update the code book. So it's a cost every time um, that you, the council passes an ordinance. Um, the, last, the last bill I got in February was uh, $1,600 for the um, ordinances that you passed. And that's for, for composition, ed editing, and shipping. And, and for the month? Or? That, was, that was just for what the packet that I sent to them. It's, it, it's very expensive. to. And um, the annual fee to keep that code book up is $1,195 every year. Um, so it's it's those are all those are all driving numbers in my budget. Um, the office supplies um, uh, are uh, the the census. The office supply forms is this the city census. Um, this year it cost $3,956 to do the, the, the printing of the census and the mailing piece of it was another $4,900 um, to mail the census out to um, the households. There were 13,939 census forms mailed out. Um, and then my election supplies are basically the, you know, the paper, the ink, and all of that for the, the, the voting machines. And my dues and membership is I pay for the mass, uh, out of this budget, I pay for the Mass City uh, Clerks uh, Association, which is $150. The Mass Town Clerks that I belong to, I pay for myself out of my own pocket. And my general liability is my bond for $100. Um, so it's a pretty bare bones budget. Um, you know, we, Certainly try. I certainly try in the clerk's office to live within my means. Um, and um, as you as you've seen, the, there is a position that has been um, eliminated from my department. Um, the mayor has um, asked me to um, cross train the um, employees over in the registrar's office. I've passed out a calendar to you um, of this year's election. Um, of everything that needs to be done up to um, the election in November. And we're gonna have another second round of um, petition papers coming out again. And it's um, at this point, um, I don't see myself cross training anybody at this point this year in the office. Um, they're gonna be very busy with the presidential election. Last two, uh, eight years, yeah. In 2008, 
with the presidential election, I work till 3 a.m. in the morning at, at, just for absentee ballots. So, I mean, uh, we've got it a little better fine-tuned, you know, than we did in 2008, uh, but still, it's going to be a huge election year, and um, I can, I, I refuse, and David knows this, I refuse to have the election subject um, to scrutiny. Um, th that the two, the two staff members over there um, need to make sure that that voters list is accurate. They need to make sure that, they're, that every person that comes in to register to vote and for the presidential election, we will have piles of them, that they are going to get entered in a timely fashion. And I will not have the Secretary of the Commonwealth coming down on me because something has not been met on that calendar. Um, so it, therefore, it leaves me as the department head out in the outer office being clerical. I'm doing clerical work. I'm doing bargaining unit work out there at a desk. I now have two desks going, um, and my wor the work in the clerk's office is 80% processing the records to get the 20% revenue that the city that you see, and and, and you know, and with, without having the staff to do that, it's going to be a problem. It's going to be really, really difficult to be able to service the general public continually the way they're accustomed to being served. I mean, something is going to have to give somewhere. And I just haven't decided where that is. Whether it means me closing again on Wednesday afternoons in order for me to catch back up on the work um, that I need to catch up on, I haven't decided that yet. Council of Art. Thank you. Welcome. Wendy, mm -hmm. in the budget book on page 38, where it is, there's a statement here about the decrease in the city court's mm -hmm. budget. Okay, yeah. At 31468 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah of eliminating one full-time position. Looking at this budget book, <coughs> it looks like two clerical, one assistant clerk, and one city clerk, <coughs> which is a total four for mm -hmm. the city clerk and register of voters mm -hmm. office, right. okay? You just mentioned about cross-training, mm -hmm. okay? Where would the problem be Wendy, of taking somebody from the Register of Voters office, one person, mm -hmm. okay, and bringing them over to help you. Well, the, first of all, let me backtrack. I've had a complete turnover of staff in my office. I have a new assistant who's been, who has been there for eight months, and so she's still learning her job. I'm still trying to train her. Um, in the Register of Voters office, um, I have a new, new senior clerk. She just started in February, which leaves uh, Mary Ellen to, try to, uh, to train her as much as she can uh, before this election uh, comes up. So it's virtually impossible for, and the person that would have to come over would be Mary Ellen, and it's, that, that's impossible because Mary Ellen is a principal clerk. The position that's being eliminated is a principal clerk. Lisbeth, who is, is the senior clerk, I can't have her come over and do principal clerk work because it's against the bargaining unit for me to do that, and I absolutely refuse to do that. I will not, I will not make a, a senior clerk do principal clerk's work. I just won't. Now, so my, it's either up to the city to upgrade her or she, she just doesn't get cross-trained. Okay, my question is, when mm -hmm. our previous mayor had, did the change, we mm -hmm. knocked the wall down and all that. Right. Okay, I think people are looking at the register of voters is also mm -hmm. part of your department. It is, that's correct. Right? It is, I'm the department head for both, yes. Mm -hmm. But they have, but was they it have ever separate mentioned, functions. Was it ever, wait a minute, Wendy. Was it ever mentioned mm -hmm. that you could take that staff from the Register of Voters mm -hmm. Office and have them help you out? They couldn't back then because we were doing passports. It was absolutely illegal for them. They, they could not. Now that passports are given up, I, I suppose that this is something that's, that's on the horizon. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's just that it's not, it's not something that's going to happen this year. Uh, you know, I, I just can't. I mean, it's Im virtually impossible for me to train somebody when I'm still trying to train my assistant and I'm still trying to train somebody that's just started in February. You know, it, it's, you just can't do it. That's why I'm asking you. you can't. I'd like to know how you could get that office to function by removing somebody from the Register of Voters Office to your office to help you out with cross-training. Now, another question I have mm -hmm. for you, 
We are looking also at that last little paragraph, which is comparable to mm -hmm. communities with mm -hmm. similar populations. Mm -hmm. Now, I had talked with Susan Wright mm -hmm. on Friday in regards to that yep. language mm -hmm. early on Friday morning. Poor Susan, I was really spending time with her. Mm -hmm. Okay, and was hoping to get whatever was done there of where the, the mayor and his office got that information. So I finally was able, I called Susan today because I had not received it and it was brought forth to me but I couldn't print it out so Mary went to the mayor's office so I could have it for tonight. But my question is, and I think I need to recognize the mayor on this one please, is the comparisons that are done on this chart. Who did the comparison in your office, Mayor? Was it? Um, actually, uh, it's a student intern, speaking of intern. So we have an intern who's with us from the University of Massachusetts. His name is uh, Joe Garland. He's actually here in the audience. Uh, and he's been helping us do a number of research-related items in the office. So uh, he did uh, the legwork in terms of uh, making phone calls to those communities and doing the statistical analysis and preparing the slides for them. This is the first time I'm really being able to study this, Mayor. And my question is, has this been brought to Wendy's attention? Mm -hmm. So yes. you've sat down with? No, I'm, no I've, I've, uh, David brought it into me, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. I, what do you feel of this that has been done? I, I'd like to know. Well, I mean, like, first of all, I mean, like, you know, when they're using five people in my office, I mean, you know, look, if you're looking at Hoyoke, for instance, okay, okay. let's take Hoyoke, for instance, okay? Hoyoke has a city clerk who's the clerk of the city council, but then she also has other staff people. I mean, the, the registrar of voters is totally separate. I mean, she's the head, she, she's the department head for the registrar, but she has staff members, to, to separate staff members to handle the registrar of voters. They're not part of the city clerk's office at all. And I mean, she has an assistant, she has a second assistant, she has a head clerk, and she has a principal clerk. You know, and she's, she's the council clerk. So I don't believe that the city clerk in, in, in Hoyoke is out there waiting on the counter and, and, and doing birth certificates and dog licenses. She's got a staff to do that. So she's able to handle other things. Now, when you, when you got this chart, mm -hmm. you went and did research on this? I didn't do too much. I didn't do too much because, I mean, I just didn't have the time to, to call all of these communities. I mean, you know, it, you, you you see you see the analysis, and I mean you know if you're looking at if you're looking at uh, Gardner, which is you know three plus. I have no idea whether Gardner has uh, has a has a hospital, whether they have nursing homes in Gardner or not. That's a driving force as well. I mean when you're looking at vital records. I mean if you don't have a hospital and you don't have nursing homes there, then you're not going to have the, the same amount of records that I've done. In, in the city of Northampton because they will be waiting for the communities to send it to them. If they have a hospital, then they're gonna have the same amount of records that I have. You know, the, those are the driving forces. You cannot use a town as a comparison for a city because the towns do not have a hospital, they do not have nursing homes, and so the records that they're having, they get are basically from the cities and towns that have these facilities. Like Williamsburg. They just put out their town report. She had 19, she had 19 births for, the, for 2011. You know, I had 800. So it's like, you know, there's a big difference there. You can't, that's, you're trying to compare apples and oranges and you can't. Okay, so what I'm hearing right now, because I don't know anything about <coughs> the comparisons mm -hmm. from other cities or towns, is my concern of you analyzing this chart and you just said how you felt about the comparisons mm -hmm. on here. I want to know as a city councilor, can you actually run your office with what has been done to this budget with one city clerk, one assistant clerk, and two clerical cur clerks? Well, if you're asking I me I want to know about lunch hours. I want to know <coughs> about, mm -hmm. I'm hearing you say that you'll have to shut your mm -hmm office on a Wednesday afternoon and that bothers me because to me 
it's our job mm -hmm. to go ahead and service our residents right. here in the city. Mm -hmm. But because you're minus one staff, you might have to do that. Right. Exactly. That's a red flag for me because at one point, I remember there was a problem in your office mm -hmm. and you were really upset because of what, whatever was going on in there. I want to know right now for <clears> you, <throat> can you actually run that office with minus one person? Can I run it? I can. Can I run it efficiently? No. Uh, Councillor Adams. How long were you functioning with five FTEs for? Oh, God. Um, <clears throat> we had, let's see, we had five, <clears throat> let's see, when Christine was there, so it was, it was in, <clears throat> in the, <clears throat> See, Adeline retired in 1990, so somewhere around there. It's been steadily going down. We had, we actually had five plus an election, part-time election person. <coughs> Excuse me. And then slowly we got down to four. Then it was three. <clears throat> then one year I was back to two. When it was Lynn and I. <clears throat> Excuse me. When do you want to get a drink of water? <coughs> drink of water. It's it. I'm gonna take a little brief recess. By the way, while when is there, there are other counselors who want to ask questions, so I can get you all lined up. What? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it's my no, allergies. no, it's the allergies are brutal, yeah. and it's okay. So, <clears throat> in two thousand. Um, nine or ten we were down to two people and of course then in my <clears throat> ingenuity I had dummies in all the places where um, there should have been bodies and <clears throat> I got a third person back I don't intend to do that again but it made my point point. Um, and uh, we got a third person back I mean it was extremely difficult I mean, you cannot function in an office with two people. You cannot have vacations. I mean, <clears throat> I have two people over in the registrar's office. They deserve vacation as well. So who's going to, I mean, who's going to be left to run the office if, if one person over in the registrar's and then my assistant has to go on vacation? That leaves me all by myself, you know, and it leaves, leaves Elizabeth all by herself. So we don't, I don't take a lunch hour. I haven't taken a lunch hour in two years. How many hours, how many hours a week are you open? Is it, is it seven hours? Four thirty. Yeah, eight thirty to four thirty. Yeah. Um, because you know other <clears throat> cities and towns close sometimes, right? It, most of the towns are closed on Friday. Okay. Most of the. Is towns that a reason why we've been at five maybe for several years? Because when I when I look at mm -hmm. the the um, when I look at this presentation, mm -hmm. Chicopee has six yeah. FEs and they have almost double. Mm hmm the population they have 27 yep. oh yeah they, their people. population the Westfield is has yeah. fewer FTEs and they have yeah. 13,000 mm -hmm. people so I'm wondering <clears throat> as you said obviously it's not apples to apples we're talking no. here but I'm just I'm just curious as to how other cities cities I'm not, I know mm -hmm. you said it's different when it comes to towns but we're talking about we're talking about cities here as mm -hmm. well on, on this on this data so I'm wondering and I don't expect you to have this answer off the top of your head but I'm wondering how um, they've done it larger cities um, have done it with with um, I mean, now that you're 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 reducing to four. But you have to understand. Like you have to understand they're like reducing, but their clerk is not a clerical clerk. Okay, their clerk is not out there. I mean, they have I mean, they have uh, they have sufficient staff to handle the job that's needed. I, I hear you, but I mean, I, I don't I don't know from this data. Yeah. Uh, there's many cities, several mm -hmm. cities listed here, and, and, and right. And I just don't know if if they're all structured because their that clerk way. Is too busy tied up with city council to be out at the. Uh, out at the uh, the counter waiting on a cu customer for dog licenses. So, I, mean, I mean, maybe I mean, I'd be curious to yeah. know if that explains maybe our. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I've had so many people come in and that can't believe that I, as a city clerk, am standing there doing their dog license for them. They find that absolutely ridiculous, and they've told me so. I said, well, I said somebody has to do it. So, I mean, it's either I'm, I'm it. So, yeah. So. <clears throat> Awesome. Uh, Councilor Carney and then Councilor Schreiber. Mm -hmm. Clearly you're stretched mm -hmm. uh, beyond your capacity. Yeah, I am. Um, I asked this uh, with um, Steve Connor, mm -hmm. and he's made really good use of interns, which I understand can be more trouble than they're worth. I can't use them. It's a union position. Okay. 
it, so in terms of there, but it, it doesn't it similarly violate the union contract for you to be doing bargaining? Yes, unit? it does. I'm so just waiting. I'm just waiting for them to to to, to, file to come grievance. in. Yeah, right. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Is there uh, is there any way around being able to have some of the very basic, um, if not? Is there anything that's outside of the scope no. of that that you might be able to get help Nothing, from? Nothing, because it's all incorporated in their job descriptions. So there is absolutely nothing. Yeah. <clears throat> and I would have a problem with interns because I have a lot of confidential records in there. I, I, that would. Well, what I would, yeah. if, if it were possible, mm -hmm. and I know it's yeah. not, it seems some very basic things like dog licenses. Well, yeah, I mean, it, like it, that some, might something really like that. But you know, that's also incorporated into their job description. I understand. So, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I'm walking this fine line here, you know, with with trying to accommodate the general public and yet, you know, <clears throat> violating the union standards at the same time. Mm -hmm. So. Comes from respect. <clears throat> uh, and I wouldn't want you to do this because uh, you guys provide great service. Mm -hmm. And it's always fun to actually come into your office. Oh, well, absolutely. But, with. Yeah. But, um, if you needed to, could you, like other towns, just close for a full day a week? And again, I hate for that could to happen, do, but yeah. will that help you? And how much does it help? I mean, the, the point of it would help with the simple fact of being able to catch up on on what we're so totally behind. I mean, I have I right now I have like 50 birth records sitting in the queue waiting to waiting for yeah. me. And I've had I've had <clears throat> five phone calls from parents looking for their birth record that I can't get to. Um, it would certainly help. But it won't help if the, if I have to take phone calls. Well, is it would it have to be minus the telephone ringing. Right. Is it possible to do that? I mean, one of the things we're mm -hmm. looking at in a lot of departments, whether it's the schools and laying off important teachers in the school and reading specialists. I mean, the city. It, again, I hate to do this. <clears throat> and I, oh, think I do it's too. It's important I, yeah. for people to be able to go in every day. But if you're not going to be able to function, I would say, you know what? We're going to need to start I looking at what what are we going to pay for, and if we can't pay for it. It's certainly in the long run not going to pay to have everybody in your office burned out. No. And if you need to close the office one day and turn off the phones one day, then we're just going to have to go to bat for you and, uh, and get people to understand that's not your decision. No. That's us making you do that. And that may just need to and, be what and, and, you know, and, and I'm talking about it specifically for this year because it's going to be a very busy election. I hear you. And yeah. it's going to be <clears throat> it's going to be absolutely crazy in there. And so something is going to have to be put aside in order for me to deal with the election and making sure that the election stays, you know, the integrity of the election is there. Right. And we've all seen you mm -hmm. running these elections, which you do great, and they also take a huge amount of time. They do. Um, <clears throat> so, I, you know, I would really encourage you to look at closing for a day, turning off those phones, catching up on your work, so that the other days you and your staff mm -hmm. don't just feel completely overwhelmed with work. Well, that'll be something that I guess David and I will have to sit down, the yep. mayor and I will have to sit down and discuss. Council Schwartz and then Council Freeman Daniels. I just want to, I just want to echo Councillor Spector's comments. Meaning, I think that there, I will, I defer to the calculations that you make with the mayor, mm -hmm. um, and just support the necessary limits to get the job done and be able to stay healthy and have your coworkers stay healthy and to stay in the job. Well, that's just, yeah, that's the other thing, and you know, making sure that I keep the co keep the, the the staff that I have, and so I don't continue to have a turnover. And I have to say, I have to say thank you to my assistant who did all of these charts. Um, she spent a lot of time on them. Um, so kudos to uh, Pamela Powers for for doing that. Well, I just want to finish. Sure, right, right. Um, that, that um, I mean, I, I again, a little bit on the echoing, but want to underscore uh, Councillor Spector's comments around the chicken coming home to roost around our resources, and that you know we know that across the city budget, everybody mm -hmm. is paying the price mm -hmm. for these for continually diminishing resources, and I do think that we all we all need to stare at that and live the consequences mm -hmm. as as required. And Absolutely. I just there's just a reality and. And, and, that's, and, I, and I did say that to David in our conversation that I hope that if we're doing um, comparisons, um, that he would reach out and do comparisons with other departments as well. Um, that uh, you know that have a lot of I won't say a lot of staff, but have more than what I have, and to reach out to these same communities and find out what they have for staffing as well. I mean. Um, you know, fair is fair. You know, it's fair game here. You know, if, if it's going to be for the clerk's office and it's going to be cross training, then it needs to be cross training for everyone. Councilor Freeman Daniels. 
Thank you. Uh, Ms. Mazer, you earlier mentioned about upgrading mm -hmm. a, could you go through that again? Was that a senior clerk to a principal <coughs> clerk? Was yes. That, that is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're talking about really what, what a $4,000 upgrade depending forward. upon where she fell on on, uh, on the, the pay scale and what would that do for your office well it would just mean that I'd be able with with cross training be able to to try next year to bring her over versus Mary Ellen because she's newer she has much more computer experience and she would be she's much more knowledgeable with computers that would be much easier for me to train her over on my side so would that uh, make your job easier in the, in the it would help yes it would help absolutely mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Wendy? Marianne? Yes, thank you. Um, okay, we do know that you did have um, a really significant amount of a turnover in your mm -hmm. office. Right now, <clears throat> with your staffing that you have, how do your staff feel about this one position being taken away? They're not happy. Not happy at all. Do they feel that they are really under a lot of stress in your office, work-wise? Oh, my assistant is. My assistant is under a tremendous amount of stress at this point. And I mean, the, the other two girls over on the other side um, try to at least answer the phones when they're ringing off the hook, um, you know, and we can't get to them because we're at the counter. Um, so they do try to at least take a message and a, <clears throat> and a phone number for us to call them back. Uh, but so it is it's stressful for them it's stressful for them for the fact that knowing that um, they want that the cross training piece of it so they're very worried about their own jobs over on their own side that it's that something's going to be amiss on their own side versus over on my side so and I hate to use sides but they're two distinct they're two distinct functions and <clears throat> And that needs to be that needs to be clarified because those the two clerks over in the registrar's office know absolutely nothing about the clerk's office whatsoever. They never have, and they you know, and they never did. They had their own jobs to do over there, and they're very important jobs to do. I mean, they're getting they're getting into a process now where they're going to be sending out 4,200 confirmation cards. These are to all the people in the city that chose not to send their census back, and that's that's not household. That's individuals. There's 4,200 of them that they've got to process and mail out. That's just the start of it. And then, you know, th then as they come in, then they've got to up update all of their files. So, I mean, and this has to be done before the September election. I want to thank you, Wendy. I want to thank your staff. Thank you. And I know many of my residents who have gone in there, and when they do, they tell me that they can see it, okay, that there is like different turnover, mm -hmm. and they would ask me what was going on, but they always felt welcome. So I want to thank you and your staff. Thank you. Wendy, thank you for thank you. sacrificing your voice and your time with thank us. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Just Mr. Garland for the analysis. What's that? Thank you, Mr. Garland for the uh, analysis. Mr. Garland, thank you for the analysis and the, and the breakdown. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Next up, the Department of Public Works. Uh, come on up, Ned. You're welcome to come up too if you want, or you can stay there. So, uh, Ned Huntley, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you get, you want to make a presentation, and then we'll ask you questions. Or? That's what I was planning to do. Good job. That's, uh, right, you're on. What you'd like to do tonight? Um, good evening, everyone. Here for the Department of Public Works. And to start off, I'd like to talk about. Um, Overall, our budget. Um, I printed the city budget on yesterday morning. I was reviewing it. I did notice on the first page there is a error in the first paragraph. I'd like to correct um, on this, even though the numbers in the back are are are, are correct. It talks about a 3.156 million dollar budget. The last sentence of paragraph one is actually 3.256 million. So it's a hundred thousand dollars off. I think the mistake was in the extra hundred thousand dollars they put towards. Snow and ice operations. I think that's where that came from. Is this is this the general fund side of the DPW? It's approximately. That's correct. That Three that's point correct. two. Five Three six. point two five six. I believe the numbers in the back are, are correct. It's not if somebody didn't get transferred to the front. That's all it's talking about on that. What section is that, Ned? 
is on page. Let's pick some of the narrative. Six. Page 86, first paragraph, last sentence. And what's the figure? It's 3.256. Thank you. Okay. Um, overall, uh, DPW has a lot of responsibilities in the city. Uh, highways, parks, cemetery, admin, administration, uh, engineering, uh, water treatment, water uh, water conveyance, uh, sewer conveyance, sewer treatment, flood control, uh, stormwater management. So a lot of different hats we wear all the time. I think the, the budget outline pretty much nails it right on the head of what we do here on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we have four budgets before you this year. Uh, one is for the general fund, which is $3.256 million. It's up $100,000 from last year. Uh, the reason it's up $100,000 was the increase to snow and ice spending that we received this year. It basically brings our snow and ice level to about what we would spend on a low snowfall year. So it's kind of almost funded for that situation, but not of years past where we typically had six to $700,000 a year on that budget. The next budget is sewer enterprise. The proposed budget is $5.517 million. Uh, that includes uh, the wastewater treatment plant um, and the sewer conveyance system that delivers all the wastewater from your homes and businesses to the plant. Uh, the next one is water enterprise, which has a budget of $7.136 million. That's our largest enterprise fund. Uh, that grew, basically doubled overnight when we built the water treatment plant and that came operational in 2008. And the last budget we have tonight is the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund, which uh, this year is requested to be $3.764 million. And um, total DPW budget request is $19.674 million. Um, that includes all four uh, budget requests. Um, as far as things that are going on, I'm sure if you have questions on the general side, we are actually asked to do a level funded budget. And so that's what we did do. So we, there was no changes but the snow and ice. But some of the things that have water department, sewer department, that you should be aware of and what's driving the rates to go higher on these enterprise funds is the assumptions we made in the work that needs to be done in the near future. Uh, overall, in water, sewer, um, we're looking at doing asset management plans. We've been doing this for about a year now. Uh, the City Council approved a large uh, comprehensive wastewater management plan uh, last year. That project is about halfway through at this point. Out of that project will come a list of capital projects that will be looked at over the next 20 years for implementation. Um, there's also additional items that, will, that are coming at us also from both directions on water and sewer is uh, new mandates, new permits that are coming that we're going to have to implement uh, from the regulatory communities being the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Environmental Protection. On the water side, some of the assumptions that were made this year was that we have the Upper Roberts Meadow uh, Reservoir deconstruction activity. That's a $1.2 million project that's being mandated by the Office of Dam Safety. We also have $6 million in dam projects that are going to start in FY15 and 16. Uh, these are also being mandated through the phase two studies from the Office of Dam Safety, and these are to our drinking water supplies. Uh, there's also uh, $4 million on the water side that's going towards phase one of the new DPW complex. That is built into this budget also, assuming that the project may start in FY14. Uh, we've been carrying that project for a number of years uh, without successful funding for the project to move forward. Uh, major things on the sewer enterprise fund, uh, that, are, that are happening this upcoming year. Obviously, the comprehensive wastewater management plan is ongoing at this point. Um, some of the other assumptions that we're working on is that uh, we need to uh, put about a million dollars into a sewer line replacement from the industrial park. Uh, it's currently under capacity to serve the needs of that industrial park going into the future. Uh, this past year, we did fund the Bradford Street pump station that was part of the narrative. Uh, with a more jobs grant of $1.125 million that help offset that cost. We have the comprehensive wastewater management plan that's ongoing at this point. Uh, we also have the uh, $4 million uh, set, set aside in this to begin FY14 for the uh, phase one the DPW barns replacement. Um, as far as the landfill goes, Solid Waste Enterprise Fund, um, as everyone knows, the landfill is closing this fiscal year. 
we believe it will be out of life sometime in early spring at this point. Uh, so we are going to be uh, looking at a new era of solid waste management in the city. The Board of Public Works with various subcommittees and task force are looking at how we will manage these waste streams going forward. I'm glad to say that for all purposes that I can see and reasonable assumptions made is that we will finish the solid waste enterprise fund on a positive note. All debt service associated with the landfill and all its borrowing will be taken care of at the closure of the landfill this, this fiscal year. So overall, in a quick summary, um, that's our budget. Uh, Jeanette, first I'd like to thank you, especially on the landfill for, and everybody at the DPW for the long-term planning you did on that. So that we, the costs here, we're, we're not being hit with a lot of additional costs. W what kind of surplus are we looking at when we, uh, we finish all the, the landfill co co costs of closing? If everything goes according to plan, we'll, we believe we'll be a, a few hundred thousand dollars in the black. You, you mentioned the piece about dams, and I'm on that joint committee, and we've looked at when the federal government comes in and does us, d tells us we have to do a number of things. Where will that, that money come from if and when we have to make repairs that are being required of us from the federal government? Is that going to have to be a bond issue that comes up? And um, currently, that's how we do deal with it. I know there's conversations at the state level. In fact, I have a report for you tonight it was actually issued yesterday, even though it's dated February 7th, it's the uh, Massachusetts Water Infrastructure. Um, it's a report towards, to, uh, towards financial sustainability. And in it, it discusses about the water rates across the Commonwealth and how artificially low they are to support the systems that we're currently dealing with. And what they're looking at doing, if they can allow this bill to move forward, that they would set uh, water rates at medium incomes in communities and have additional money set aside that would fund SRF programs for dam work and infrastructure works across the Commonwealth. That's one of their goals in this report, which I will give you a copy for I Great tonight. Thanks. Um, currently, there is no funding mechanism except the Water Enterprise Fund. Uh, we do have a FEMA grant application in for $1.2 million for the deconstruction of the Roberts, Upper Roberts Metal Reservoir. Uh, if that grant is approved, it will cover 75 percent. So it will cover close to a million of that cost. And just so if, if there's anybody watching at home, they understand that in this budget, if you look at a number of things, for example, on trees and shrubs, $5,000, which doesn't even begin as, to, uh, as one item, doesn't even begin to replace the tree cover that we're losing in the city. Is that correct? It doesn't anywhere near cover it. In fact, with the closing of the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund, another loss of $10,000 disappears out of that enterprise fund as a green fund that we right. committed to about five years ago. And, and this is just one area that in our whole infrastructure, tree cover just being one, we're not keeping up with the work that needs to be done. We're not keeping up with what the generation before us and the generation before them did in terms of infrastructure for the city, and we just don't have the money to do that. We, we do not have the money for that. and. And this is one of the things that the Board of Public Works has looked very hard at is all our city infrastructure and the need that we really need to focus on what we're doing now to make everything more sustainable in the future. Um, the board looked at the fact that we have over a million dollars a year in interest in water and sewer enterprise funds paying off debt service just for borrowing. And the Board of Public Works is saying, why aren't we paying more as we go? And the only way that we can do that is to build the rates up higher and store some money aside for these future projects that we, we all know are coming at us in relatively short fashion. Uh, my belief that, that 40, 50 years ago, this proactive move should have started with our infrastructure, and it didn't happen. And now we're bearing the consequences of it today. Yeah. That's why they um, no comment. Are you, uh, Council Speck, are you all set? Council Luarge? Yeah, thank you. Ned, I, I have to agree about um, the email that you sent us, counselors, about infrastructure. And I have to also agree about what is happening now and the neglect that has occurred within the past 40 to 50 years. And if I can recall, way back we had this problem with our school buildings when we had our janitors that were laid off and our buildings became 
to a point where it cost us and the taxpayers a tremendous amount of money to put them back where they should be back. I have great concerns when we hear of an increase of 9% on sewer and water bills for the next up until 2018. I want to know, as a city councilor, which I just heard you say, well, you know, this is something that's never been brought up 40 to 50 years. But I'm asking, and I have to say that I really feel that maybe the city really needs to start looking at every department having money placed so that money is there to be used when something breaks, it's there. It has not been done for 40 to 50 years, but to continuously think that you keep raising and raising on taxpayers is not the right way to go. I think we need to look at state and federal to help the city out. It's a small city, and if you're going to constantly depend on increasing fees, that is not a good way to go. So I think something's got to work out here because I'm hearing from residents that they cannot afford an increase like what is happening now. So I think we need to look at how we're going to change the system in every department and department heads in our mayor and whatever of looking at everybody having some form of a fund where you can depend on if something needs to be done, it's there. And I agree within 40 to 50 years, there could have been a lot of money in your department if there was a plan put in place. But I do know that if you're going to depend on the taxpayers of this increase to help you fix what needs to be done is not going to work. And it's not going to work. Some will do and some will not. And I, 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 I'm going to tell you, there's such an outcry right now about this seven or this nine percent increase. They're not happy. Um, and I'm hearing from yeah. prominent people here in the city. That's a long time. So, anyways, I understand where you're coming at, but I still feel there should be a plan put in place with maintenance for every department head okay. instead of depending said that on the before. taxpayers all the time. So, uh, excuse me, can, can I just respond to that? I, I totally agree with you. I wish there was a big fund to be able to do that. We just heard somebody come up who I think you and I both like a lot about her department where we can't even fund that department. Where would we possibly get the money from? And if we're looking at state and federal, as we talk about in our meeting, the state and federal government has pulled back more and more and more. It's going in the opposite direction. So that we're looking at a more and more difficult time. I wish there was a pot of money that everybody could have for repairs. We're just trying to do basic operational fees right here. So I think it's a great idea. Where are we going to get that money? In the same way that I don't think any of us here, a number of us, we threw out the idea of an override. And we, were, we talked about that will never pass and probably won't, and people would be up in arms on that, but I have no idea. When we look at this, I think this is what a number of us are trying to say. What is this city going to do in the future as state and federal government pays less, as our operational costs go up and our income goes down? So some idea of you know looking at you and saying, well, don't raise the rates, well, then what are we going to look at in terms of our, our sewer and our water system? I just don't see where the answer is. Obviously, one of my biggest concerns is the future, uh, future regulations that are coming at us in 2014, 15. There's a lot of things coming down the road on water, sewer, solid waste. The new stormwater MS4 permit that's going to be issued this year to us, it's coming at a cost of $100,000 a year, and we have no budget for it. But we're mandated by the EPA and DEP to implement this program. Uh, the dam work is being mandated by the Office of Dam Safety. The discharge permits are being mandated by the EPA and the DEP for discharges in the Connecticut River. We know nitrogen reduction is going to be part of that new permit when it's issued in early FY14, October, I think it is, uh, 2013 will be issued. Um, if you start looking at the past history of looking at what other plants have done locally, um, New Mark in New Hampshire, their removal cost was estimated at $15 million to do their treatment plant. Uh, there was a study done in 2008 
by DEP, and it looked at Northampton to achieve that discharge limit, $35 million to accomplish that. These are going to be mandated to us, and what if we don't follow the mandates? The fines get levied, the consent orders come, and we're forced to build it. This is what happened with the water treatment plant. We, were, we fought a, a waiver for filtration for years. We put off the construction of the plant for years, and we built it. It's $28 million it cost. In fact, if you look at the enterprise fund budget on the water side, we are we're, we're financially sound with cash reserves, but our operating revenue doesn't cover our expenditures until FY14, and we're looking at these 9% rates. So when the board sets the budget, they look at a five-year projection of where these rates are going and our needs over these five years. They're not saying that we are increasing the rates. Those rates are set every year. If all of a sudden there's a huge windfall of money that might come in or a program drops off we don't have to do, they might have to do a 9%, might be a 5%. The board is not seeing any of that coming our way, and they're trying to act uh, responsible to the water system, the sewer system, salaries, all the activities take, we take care of, and prudent planning of how we're going to finance this activity coming down the road. It pains the Board of Public Works to go with these rates. If you look at the history of the rates over time, you go back 10 years, the rates were uh, you know, increases of 1%, 2%, 3%. Then all of a sudden, magically, in 2002, 22% increase on the water side because the board, board of Public Works said, we need to start saving for this water treatment plant. The consent order is coming. We know it's going to cost a lot of money. we got to build up the bank account so we don't have a huge sticker shock. Over the next, next number of years, because of the outcry of the 22%, they brought it down to under 10%, and that's where we've been every year, is funding this thing between 8 9% each year to cover the cost of our debt service and for future projects that we need to do. Uh, Councilor Carney, then Councilor Adams, then Councilor LeBarge. Thank you. Um, obviously, what you're, what you're talking about also is a, a good message for residents to consider other ways that they can uh, conserve in the form of uh, usage, whether that's you know, fi fixing leaky appliances or um, just generally uh, using less, especially since uh, the rates are based directly on usage. So one way for residents to try to uh, offset that 9% is to maybe decrease their usage by 9%, which, if, you know, is probably not too hard to do if people pay really close attention. So that, that's one comment. But one other um, thing I noticed was uh, about 15 vacancies, I think, across the board, across every section uh, in uh, solid waste and water. And so um, how soon do you anticipate filling those, or will you fill all of those? So the you haven't budgeted. So. They've, they've, they've been budgeted. What we're trying to do is like the Southwest Enterprise Fund. Uh, there's a foreman position that's open. Basically, it's a we pay a person out of class for four hours a day to be in that position to cover it, because we don't want to hire another full-time person only to have a potential layoff eight months down the road from now or nine months down the road when the facility closes. <coughs> so we're doing those adjustments. Some of, the, some of them on the general side are being filled. They are being posted as we speak. Some of them were ju just jockeying around of people being advanced like the uh, highway superintendent. His past position was left open for the past year. We actually had uh, two internal candidates that we were looking what would be the best fit for that position. And we both gave a chance of trying that over the period of the year to determine our action on that. We, we made the action, and now it's backfilling that other form in one position. So we expect a number of those positions will, will be filled over time. Uh, on the water budget, I know that there's a form in one position. It really is a position that we've been trying to plan to do more maintenance work up in the watershed. And last year, we started off as a seasonal program, so we did it during the summer only, paid this uh, gentleman out of class as a working foreman, and had a couple seasonals work with him to get some maintenance work done up there. Uh, we're trying to implement that again. It's not a full-time position because we don't do a lot of maintenance work there in the wintertime, so it's more of a seasonal position. Um, so we do have some positions open. Um, we expect quite a few of them to be filled. Um, I think that's, 
Any questions? Oh, I just wanted to throw out here on, you also know that uh, Ty and Bond does an annual study on water and sewer rates each year. Last year I gave a presentation to the City Council on the rates and I believe that we were about average at this point. Um, we are above average or below average. If you look at across the Commonwealth, the average sewer bill is $638 a year. Our bill is, on a family average, is $473. Can we have that? Pardon me? Can you give us that? Here we have that. I have this information. I can, can get you the information Please. if you like. The other one is our yearly water bill uh, for a family of four households. Actually, it's 2.4 people in the household. Um, is $440. The tie bond survey across the Commonwealth, the average is $470 a year. So we're about even on the water. We're very low on the sewer as far as averages across the Commonwealth. This report's online. It's like I said, it's published every year by tie bond out of Westfield, Mass. They're a, a local engineering firm. Uh, Council with Bars and Council Murphy. Ned, in the budget book on page 99, you have 80000 on real estate taxes. Sure. That, would that be... It's water. We pay taxes would to other be, communities. Would that be the Leeds Reservoir up to the upper part of West Hampton? Would that be one of them? No. The land? No. We pay a payment in lieu of taxes to Waitley, Conway, Williamsburg, for land that Hatfield that we have in their towns uh, for property we own. We do not pay any taxes on the water treatment plant in Williamsburg because we're exempt by state law. So it's a payment in lieu of taxes to all these different communities. We do pay taxes on land that we own, watershed land. So like with what we had bought from Skibiski, mm -hmm. what's the taxes on that? Do you know? I don't know the exact taxes on the parcel, but we do pay taxes on it. And where's the land? in West Hampton, or where is the land? Isn't Mount Mountain Street Reservoir in Bergy? Don't we have some? It is in Williamsburg and Haydenville, but there's also land in Hatfield, because that abuts that. Okay. Um, West Hampton, we have a 90 plus acre piece <coughs> that feeds uh, high quality water into Roberts Meadow Brook. Uh, that's off of North Road. We've owned that for a long time. I don't know when they bought it, to tell you the truth. So we do have land in other communities that we pay taxes on. So a pot oh, I'm just We call it a payment in lieu of taxes. Um, basically, it's considered to be like a chapter status land or uh, well below assessed value land because it's protected for water quality reasons. So the typically, when you look at chapter status land or Article 97 land, it's uh, I think the fee is about 25 percent of normal assessment. Council Murphy. Uh, two questions. One on the watershed land. Have you ever looked into potential for timber harvest off that property? Which parcel? Uh, any of them, where their timber would be suitable. It's, it's being held for watershed to manage those and make some income from timber. Yes. Um, we are going through what they call forestry sewership plans at this moment. We expect to have them wrapped up by June this year. Basically, it's a evaluation of all the property owned, a watershed land. It looks at invasive species, it looks at habitat, it looks at uh, forest stands, and comes up with um, sustainable forest cutting practices that we can utilize going forward. We did receive a grant for it this past year from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And like I said, those plans will be complete. And with that, we hope that within a year we'll start doing logging activities again with the idea of building up our what we call our timber revenue account, which is how we have typically in the past acquired property. Mm -hmm. And my second question was um, with regards to the imminent closing of the landfill. If we, if we take landfill operations out of the picture and just look at the remaining departments, for instance, where's the leachate go when you don't have your own landfill to put in it, what, what would you think next year the impact's going to be on the remainder of the department financially once we're out of the landfill business? Well, we have a 30-year uh, post-closure care account, we call it, and basically under federal and state law, we have to maintain certain levels of services at that facility for a minimum of 30 years. I believe that is set at $1.9 million that we have set aside for the 30 year. It covers electricity, it covers maintenance, it covers leachate management, it covers any ongoing activity at that landfill, including groundwater monitoring. But on, as far as your department needs, I'm really concerned with 
um, leachate disposal and things of that. You know, you've used the landfill as has the rest of the city. Outside of the landfill itself, what's the impact on the remaining departments who have to dispose of things elsewhere? Um, well, it's going to hit citywide. I mean, even the Department of Public Works is going to have to find and pay for their waste stream to go somewhere, mm -hmm. such as schools are going to have to find out. Uh, parking division, every division is going to need to be able to finance and take care of their waste streams going forward because we won't be able to accept it for free like we have in the past. Um, as far as leachate, that goes into the sewer collection system. It's treated as sewage at the wastewater treatment plant, so there's no special collection treatment process out there. How about the sludge that leaves the treatment plant? You take that to the landfill, don't you? Well, that actually goes up to Moortown, Vermont. Oh, okay. So uh, that gets shipped. Already. Uh, it used to go to incineration. We used to take it to landfill until 2001 or 2002 when the Department of Environment Environmental Protection wanted said no. Basically, you can't bring it there. Okay, so it's already going somewhere else. So it's been going down to Connecticut. It's been going out to Blackstone Valley out in the Worcester area, and now uh, we actually got a really reasonable price to have it moved up to Moortown, Vermont, which is just above Mount Pelier. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor. Wood. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this presentation, no uh, Ms. Conley. Um, I am also concerned about these dam projects and. Um, I want to know when the uh, stormwater report is coming out. The stormwater report should be coming out probably, I hope, within the next week or so. We're doing the final edits with uh, Camp Dresser McKee, CDM. Um, and like I said, it's been, we were hoping that the end of April would be done. We provided them with all our final edits on it, and it should be a finalized report very quickly. And that, will, that may be a springboard for some of those projects. It may be a springboard to some of the projects, especially on the flood control side, where we have uh, gotten letters uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers that mandated us to do approximately $1.2 million worth of study work on the Mill and Connecticut River levee systems in the next two years. Can I ask about the um, budgeted underwater uh, $50,000 for architectural engineering and under wastewater treatment $100,000 for architectural engineering? Sure. Uh, we always have line items about that size. I believe last year water was $150,000. It's based on the level of activity of work that we're looking to do. And rather than borrowing money at uh, 4% interest or 3% interest for engineering work, we have historically always tried to pay for engineering out of our, our, our yearly accounts. So that's why you see those numbers that high. So, so is this one big project or is it specifically a, a number budget? of different projects um, we're working with Tata and Howard right now uh, on a asset management plan they're also doing a uh, a radio read survey for us which I think is like fifteen or twenty thousand dollars how we communicate from our reservoir systems to the water treatment plant information like that we're working with Smith College uh, put their land up near the reservoir and how we might be able to use their new facility up there to transmit data back down to us. It's small studies like that. We're doing a study evaluation of one of our transmission mains, which is uh, about 110 years old, and what we might have to do to revigorate it as a low, what we call a C value or a coefficient of friction value. And with it, we're not getting the flows that we want out of it. So we're looking at a clean and line project, but we're paying for the engineering services out of our budgets rather than borrowing and bonding for it. We've done that in solid waste also. Thank you. Council LaBarge? Yeah, well, what about the cell tower? The cell tower? We have a contract until 2020. Currently, it brings in. 23 something. It? it actually brings in about sixty dollars to $65,000 a year. There's a variable, there's a base fee that grows at 4% interest a year, or 4% a year. And then there's a carrier fee, depending on how many carriers that are hung off this tower we could collect 20% of those revenues. So that contract goes out for another eight years or so. And like I said, we'll, we'll be easily $60,000 a year. The cell tower has approached us about extending the contract. Uh, obviously, we had a conversation a year ago or a year and a half ago about them procuring a permanent easement and buying out the contract. Um, but right now, everyone appears to be satisfied to let the contract run, run its course. And sometime in 2019, we'll put it out to bid again. Um, and I'll just take the prerogative of the chair just for a moment, just to comment the fact that the uh, federal government and the state government 
um, it place mandates, those mandates are precedents, right? Those take precedence over any other projects by and large? They do. So they do that at the same time while reducing revenue from both the federal and state government. And essentially what it forces us to do is to raise fees. Fees are intrinsically regressive because it's not based on a person's ability to pay. A family of four could be making $20,000 a year or $300,000 a year and still consume the same amount and consequently have the same price um, burden, burdening them. So the <coughs> you guys are clearly in a very tough situation, consequently so are we, and when the conversations come, the uh, people get very upset, obviously, as, as you know better than most, because you're usually the firewall that gets the blistering heat. The and. <coughs> And it, it speaks to our larger frustration that I think Councilor Schwartz referred to and Councilor Specter, the, the frustration that comes from the general design and construct of the way we affect business. People have said uh, these, these increases in fees don't make any sense because we didn't have to pay these before. Well, the problem is circumstances and things have changed and there is an obligation, one, to maintain sustainability and safety clearly, and these are the things that we come to rely on. And, uh, but as, as Council of Barge was referring to, the number of people were very, very upset, of course, at this, what looks to be an onerous fee that's being assigned to them without, without a buy your leave. So it's a little trickier than with taxes, so. These, most of these fee increases are coming through number one, mandated projects that are required by regulatory communities, and also the driving aid to the Board of Public Works that we really need to start paying attention to our infrastructure and start planning for replacement of systems that are failing or about to fail. And what we're looking at is trying to assign, through these asset management plans, we actually look at assigning a risk of failure and the consequences of that failure and try to weigh out what is the most important next capital project to do. Well, and, and I actually am very <laughs> glad that you're talking about being proactive and but it's much harder to sell to a constituency that that's more concerned with reactive systems and to and we all know the consequences of deferred maintenance then that's a no one knows better than you and we've seen this and as councilor barge mentioned we saw this with the schools we've seen this with other systems as we if you continue to defer maintenance and you continue to defer these projects there is there's a bill to be paid down the line and you're passing it on down the line so we do we do bear some responsibility but at the same time um, it comes with, it comes at a considerable price. But clearly, I think the most important thing is the conversation. The conversation, and I think, uh, you know, through some, some, some mix-ups, the opportunity to have the conversation about increased fees didn't really get to be had. So uh, I understand that you guys are convening tomorrow? That will be tomorrow night. We have that conversation. Yeah, for for uh, uh, people who are interested in having the conversation, it's a do-over, right? Basically, you're doing a do-over of the review of the rates uh, because of the posting kerfuffle there. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Sorry to just get back into the details after we zipped up to the federal and state level, but uh, noticing the revenues under the water enterprise receipts, the undesignated fund balance went down a lot this year, mm -hmm. over half a million dollars. Could you just, just explain that? Is that This it? is where the rate increases, like I said, we've historically have had a loss on our revenue to expenditure side for a number of years since we built the water treatment plant. When we, when the board looked at these five-year projections of where we should be going with these 9% increases, 9.5% set increases in water and sewer, we come back into the black in the operations daily in FY14. And then we start building the capital reserves we need for the future projects. So, so that's why it took a loss, because we're paying off debt service. Large amounts of debt service on that $28 million plant. Are we talking about the same thing here? This is the undesignated fund balance? Yes. That, yeah. It's a revenue to the city that then dropped down to, it's, it's budgeted at 344. Yes, what happens so, is that it, it hits that account when we don't have the revenues to cover it, it takes out of that free cash account, basically. I see, okay. Councilor Adams. I just wanna say, um, I appreciate what you've done. I appreciate the work of the department. I also wanna say that it must be difficult to, to, to hear 
criticisms coming from the same council and the same councilors who voted to shut the landfill um, because that further ties your hands financially. I mean, I was one of the councilors who voted to shut it, and I stand by that decision for re reasons I won't enumerate here. But I think we have to be consistent. If we're going to further tie our hands financially and the department's hands financially, we either have to deal with the fact that fees are going to go up or we're going to have to find another revenue source or services are going to go down. So I just want to keep us keep in mind that we need to be consistent and either have lower expectations when we're making decisions that are going to limit you financially or give you the means or allow you to come up with the means yourself through raising fees, et cetera, so that you can continue to provide the same services. Thank you. Um, the Board of Public Works also had a conversation several weeks ago about that, uh, the fact that they, they had an analogy that it was basically a card house. And we're being level funded, yet everything's going up in price, gasoline's going up, cost, things are just going up in price. And at what point do you pull the wrong card out and things start falling down? And what services fall down and fall through the loop? Now, right now, I th we're trying to be proactive and try to keep everything we have going. Um, but I do have concerns of what next future fiscal years will be with level funded budgets. Ed, thank you very much for your yep. presentation. Um, I, appreciate it. I have this for everyone, including uh, the mayor and Susan Wright. Uh, it's a great executive summary read. There's nothing like a great executive summary read, really. Um, I'll let you pass it around, but basically it says that in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, they're looking at a $10.2 billion gap in resources for drinking water, $11.2 billion gap for clean water, wastewater projects, and $18 billion in stormwater that we're deficit in right now in the Commonwealth. So we are not alone in this community. I think every other community is facing the same struggles that we are. It's a matter of, um, I, I've always looked at the fact that what were the water commissioners thinking back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when they started acquiring land for our reservoir system, and now look at the wonderful abundant drinking water supply we have now. They were thinking 100 years ahead, and that's what the current board is trying to do, except maybe not 100 years, but they're looking at 20, 30 years ahead for the next few generations of the people that live and do business here. Thank you, Ned, for that cheery narrative. I Thank you. That. Yes. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Anne Marie, you're up next. Time for the rec department. Good evening. Hello. Ready for me to jump right in? Yeah, go go to do your best. Okay. Um, so the recreation department, our our budget isn't quite as large as uh, as Ned's. Um, basically, our goal is providing um, as many great, wonderful programs, high quality programs that we can at affordable prices for everyone in the community. Just a couple highlights um, this past year is that we we're proud to be part of the first Northampton Family Fourth, which was the, the uh, about 7,000 people came to Look Park for the fireworks and family fun day that Priscilla Ross spearheaded with the city last year. So that was a huge, huge effort with a, a lot of people and we were very excited that we're doing that again June 23rd. We also had a, another great new project just a couple weeks ago of uh, Gush Valenta family fund 5k race that we fundraised almost eight thousand dollars with with that new thing so we're always doing new things looking for new revenue streams and and uh, we have a great staff working on things like that um now right now we're gearing up for um the hundreds of kids that are going to be starting our summer camps take part in our lessons our sports our tennis um, Museani beach is opening in a couple weeks believe it or not with this weather um hopefully it'll warm up and we have the pool at JFK that we operate um, in conjunction with, with the school too. So all that is, is happening. The budget you have in front of you is um, about $197,000 is what um, there are the general fund supports for our department. Um, in addition to that, we also generate about an additional five hundred fifty to $600,000 in our revolving funds through our fees and charges that, and that helps fund um, all the additional programming expenses and operational expenses we have with the rest of the programs that don't come out of the general fund. Um, throughout the year, as you know, there's over you know, 100 different programs and events going on. And we have seven full-time staff that you see in the budget. Um, and many, much of their, some of them are um, funded through the revolving funds. We also have approximately 90 other uh, part-time staff um, throughout the season 
in our in all of our other programs and at the pool and things. So besides the seven full time, there's a good 90 others that work for us. And those their wages are paid through all those recreation fees that I mentioned. And then also we can't forget the hundreds of volunteers that do so much for for all the work with the kids in the city and all the thousands and thousands of hours of time that they give. Um, we couldn't do pretty much a lot of what we do without them. So um, we also work closely with uh, DPW, with the Parks and Cemetery Division, scheduling their fields and, and their maintenance and things, and also with the Office of Planning and Development on securing grants and development of recreational facility, facilities throughout the city. Um, so if anyone has any questions on uh, I think Council Adams was first and then Council Park. Looking at the five year trend, could you just explain generally why um, well, why we see what we do, which is we're around 195,000, 2009, then it dipped uh, down to about 192, then went up um, consistently in, in a good, good amount for the next three years? Um, I don't have that page. What? What is that? It's a $4,000 problem. Oh, 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 up here. Okay. 2010. Um, it could be how, I'm not really, it could be how they, in 2010, you mean, how it went down to 190? Right. Uh, it could be how some of the budget was shown in the different years. I know Chris Pyle would have us. Um, show some things in revolving, you know, and, and show all the staff in revolving and I don't know, I'm not really sure. 190. I don't know. I don't know. It's only a 6,000. Yeah, oh, okay, thank I mean, you. It's only it's about thank $6,000. It, it looks like it's going yes. up and down. It's about, yeah. dollars wise, about 6,000. Yep. Yeah. It was probably one of the, one of the rec, rec supervisor positions that wasn't filled for, usually it takes a few months to fill those positions when people leave, so. Okay. Can't really read the numbers on my copy, so. <laughs> Uh, Council LeBarge? Yes, thank you. Um, last year, the 4th of July fireworks at Look Park. Mm -hmm. Now, I know like when I go to Stanley Park when they have theirs, it's really great. Do you like have volunteers out there who collect money or anything like that? How much did you make? Um, well, the whole thing costs somewhere around 30000 and so being the first year, we tried to get as many volunteers as we could out there. Like when you go to East Hampton or Westfield, they have people all over the place. So we weren't quite as successful as getting people all over collecting. But we covered through all the um, sponsors and donations, we covered the $30,000 cost last year. So I'm not sure how much you know was actually given in the little glass jars that a few people walked around with. But altogether, um, the 30000 was raised to cover the, the cost of it. And we're already... I think we, we just started fundraising again with the with the group this past month, getting all the letters out and things. So I think we're close to eight thousand right now. So. So you're not sure about how much you did collect that night? Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I I can't yeah I can't recall it off the top of my head what it was there, but we're gonna have more people walking around this year. <laughs> so. Also, um, I have a concern about. The hurricane that occurred last year mm -hmm. and I just had received a call from somebody on my ward who does play um, softball yep. dance map yep. and has great concerns and I did email Ned Huntley this mm -hmm. morning in regards to Ryan Road School of redoing the whatever the playing fields out there for these guys because right now you've lost what over seven thousand something of money from them so those are two separate um fields that i, yeah. I think that you're referring to the the hurricane damage that was at mainsfield right and um that fema money has been has been allocated to the city uh, and dpw net is working on that with his staff because they're the ones who will be doing all the construction and i think he mentioned how someone just got promoted to the head of the parks uh, probably within the past month. So they're working on their plan to start fixing up Mainsfield coming up within the next month. Um, so they're they're on board to start that now. Um, okay, because you know. Dan mentioned so. something to the effect that there has been frequently meetings going on about Ryan Road School playing fields. 
in that they wanted to clear that's the email that I got from him yep. if you were gonna either do them or not do them right and that's the all right so the Mainsfield one has to do with the hurricane the Ryan Road Finn school one has to do with converting one of the existing fields to a different size field okay which again the DBW is working on it's it, they are the ones who do all the maintenance and, and with their laundry list we met last week to go through the huge list of what has to be done there actually are people in the city who want to volunteer their time to help redo the field they want to convert it from a 60 foot diamond to a 50 slash 70 foot diamond that probably doesn't mean much to you but different sizes for different age groups so they are working on it and and know that there's a, a big need and a big want for that conversion up at Ryan Road right so Ned and I just talked about it briefly before okay before I came so up here. do you actually from the guys you get money for renting the fields from them or what because on here from the league what from the leagues yeah. you mean from um, the way right now a few years ago DBW cut their whole um, a portion of their parks division maintenance budget for taking care of the parks so they cut a bunch of that and when that happened we instituted the rec department who runs the programs on fields and organizes the program it doesn't have anything to do necessarily with doing the actual maintenance we instituted a five dollar per child and a fifteen dollar per adult um, usage fee which basically covers the DBW parks division some of their gasoline for their mowers some of their equipment some of that stuff so that brings in typically about fifteen thousand dollars a year that goes towards the parks division of the DPW somehow. Because on page 81, um, on your four year 12 highlight, yep. it says this has had a huge impact as that it is over 7,000 in income we, we rely on to fund our department. Yep, so the income from the field usage fee is separate from the income, now that's talking about the men's softball league that plays at mains field right the men's teams all pay a certain fee to play in the leagues and that those fees pay for the for all the operation costs as well as part of the supervisor in our office who runs those leagues okay. so that seven thousand dollars is part of what goes towards her salary that because okay. we didn't have the fields last fall we weren't able yeah. to do the league and then this spring again <coughs> we to start the league because it's not there and people are just really frustrated and want to get out there and play softball so Thank you. <laughs> and I um, wish I had the maintenance staff to be able to say, I go know. ahead. <laughs> I know. Emory, how, how many, f you, you guys charge, I mean, you're sustaining yourself with fees, as you say. Mm -hmm. How many uh, fee streams do you guys have to navigate, and how do you navigate it? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what you what do you mean how many how many programs how, yeah, many? how many people you know you have you have fees coming from rental fields you have uh, 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 every program single program fees. every and single program has you know, yeah, you know so how many of those accounts do you have well we have three revolving funds so we have you know each revolving fund has their certain number of programs that we have a revolving fund for all the sports programs and that revolving fund can help can pay for some of our full-time staff so there's probably a good 75 line items on that that come in from all, maybe maybe 50 all the different sports programs that we run so the money comes in there pays for all operations yeah. and and in, in in your department who manages all that who juggles all those um, we have a department secretary who does the um, like the munis system and pays you know does all that and takes all the credit card cards in figures out where all the credit card money goes and all that so we have a department secretary who oversees it all does anyone have any other questions for Emily? Oh, that was relatively painless on this so. And you're back on time now. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Thank you so much. For All right, thanks. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Up next, Patty, Council on Aging. Thank you for coming in. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. Do you, you want to give a presentation first, and then we'll open it up to questions, or do you just want to go right to questions, or how do you? Um, I'll do a presentation. Sure, and let's I do that. Yep. You got and you I have materials, so we'll take materials. <laughs> Thank you. Well, 
good evening. Um, I'd also like to uh, just introduce, if uh, you don't know who they are, we have Joan Finn, who is a Council on Aging board member and a volunteer doing many things at the Senior Center. Maureen Senkowitz, who um, is probably one of our newer uh, board members, and by that I mean probably about a year and a half. And Mike Ahern, who um, is our board chair and also serves as the president of our friends group, Elder Vision Inc. And uh, also, all of them volunteer doing a number of things for us, thank goodness. Um, so I handed out a packet to everyone. Uh, a number of these items I'll talk about, and I promise not to go in detail about every single item in here, but I think it is reflective of who we are as a Council on Aging and Senior Center, that um, we are more than just putting on um, social events, we're more than putting on parties, we're more than uh, taking trips here and there. There are many facets of what we do that um, are what we're gonna call invisible uh, experiences and opportunities at the, the um, Senior Center which we opened September 30th, 2007. Thank you, City of Northampton, for building that for us. And thank you to the community and all the volunteers who raised um, a little over $500,000 to furnish that entire building. Um, so anything you're sitting on in there, anything you're using as a shelf or a pot in the um, kitchen, that was all uh, raised um, by the community and, and volunteers. And it, it all went through the Friends Group, which is a, a wonderful senior center. So thank you, Northampton. Um, according to the 19, I'm sorry, the 2010 federal census, Northampton's population for seniors has grown by 933 new seniors, which we truly welcome. Not that I've met all 933, but they're here, and uh, many people are retiring to Northampton for a variety of reasons. One, because there's a national uh, discussion about Northampton being a place to uh, retire to, because family members live in the area, and uh, many people just, as I think many of us do believe, Northampton is the place to be. And the Senior Center just offers many uh, opportunities and initiatives for people to uh, participate in a wide range of programs and services. Um, our, our total population in Northampton for seniors is 5,874. And I just listed some information about um, while I've been the director, <laughs> which I'm going on my 11th year as director, um, that uh, part of my responsibility, as I'm sure every department head is responsible for fiscal responsibility. And so looking at programs and making um, some tough decisions about what needs to change, what needs to happen in order to meet the needs of those seniors. And so actually three different events have happened in terms of staffing. Um, with the fitness center, which many of you were probably involved with phone calls from seniors about you know, how can we take away the two fitness coordinators. They were each 19 and a half hours. And it was a uh, revenue loss for us, and it was only serving probably no more than an average of 40 people. Well, the uh, organizational plan, the model changed. We're um, going from about 40 to 45 members a month, which really fluctuated. We now have about 108 members um, at a cost of $10 a month. So we were able to open up a program to uh, more people at a more affordable cost, and uh, we aren't losing money. So that, that's one of the items um, for revenue savings. And then also the bistro, we used to have a food service coordinator um, who was hired for 25 hours a week. And after uh, a period of not even a year, that was not a fiscally responsible program to run anymore. And so the food service coordinator was uh, released from her duties. And back in September of 2010, Mary Netto and another group of volunteers um, and um, myself, we organized another way to offer uh, that kind of a program to seniors. And um, so all of the responsibilities as a food service coordinator um, fell to me. I became certified in food services because we wouldn't be able to operate the bistro or the coffee shop um, according 
to uh, state regulations and the Board of Health. So uh, we were able to do that. And uh, further on in all this documentation, there's a, a listing of what we're calling our profit centers um, in the, the, the uh, senior center to raise uh, income to supplement uh, what we want to do for salaries and for expenditures. Um, I've included in here also, uh, May is Older Americans Month, so you all should have received our Elder Vision newspaper uh, in the mail just recently, which uh, is, is probably our focal point for everything that we do, uh, whether it's services on how to you know, enroll in um, Social Security uh, benefits, or it could be party in the park so we can celebrate those who are turning 100 years old. We have a lot of uh, <laughs> events coming on, including, and I do need to announce this, that our 10th annual health and safety fair is coming up next Thursday. We have over 66 vendors from a whole range of health organizations, everything from light therapy to massage therapy to um, the best way to use vitamins to different programs in hospitals, um, hospice. It's just a wonderful event and the public is invited to attend um, and we hope that we do get those 300 people coming through uh, to, to meet and greet and learn a lot about uh, what's happening in the health world and the world of safety. Um, on the back of page one, I just listed um, a lot of the fundraisers. I think we're probably one of the only city departments that actually has to do hands-on fundraising such as the items that are listed here. And that's a necessity because that allows us to um, pay for staff and for a lot of needed items. Um, if you look in our OM account, uh, the FY08, we had $1,650 in our OM account. And then it dropped to $650. And that $650 was to pay for everything that we needed to do in the senior center. That's buying the gas for the van, fixing um, the air conditioning in the van. And I'm going to just use the van as an example. Getting the sticker, getting um, new tires. And obviously, $650 doesn't do it for um, a department of anywhere between 8 and 10 uh, staff, as well as all the volunteers and everything else that happens. So um, last year, our budget was raised um, to $8,364, which actually gave us a sigh of relief that um, we were able to have more in our OM account from the city. So uh, that was, uh, I'm going to say, a blessing for us to be able to pay for a stove to be repaired and not have to come up with the $330 to have that uh, repaired on our own. So those are just some of the um, fundraisers, which are you know wonderful events. They just take a lot to organize and implement, but it does bring revenue into our um, accounts. And I think it's important because I think there's a general feeling, and I hear this quite often, that people feel that the city pays for everything in that senior center, and, and that's just not true. Um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of what happens in there is from the generosity of uh, staff, from volunteers, from the community. And I, I, again, I tend to always uh, congratulate our community for being so supportive. Um, our mission, which of course is what we follow, and I think with the uh, elimination of the business manager, we will be looking at that mission and looking at what it is we offer and what our true essential functions are in order to be able to still uh, continue and not burn out staff and to um, have an adequate senior center. And I don't want to say adequate, I should say to be at the point of uh, being a superior senior center um, as compared to many um, across the country. And I'm just going to back that up with a call that I got yesterday. It was a gentleman who lives in the Midwest inquiring about what ty types of programs his mother, who lives in a surrounding community, she's 82, what types of programs she could participate in at our senior center. And we are a senior center for those 60 and older as Northampton residents, but we open it up to many other communities and seniors, including 55 to 59. And so he said, well, I was on your website and you offer a lot. Um, I really don't want my mother to have to just go to the one that is in her community because they don't really offer a lot. You do a lot of engagement within your programs and was very complimentary. And his intent with his brother who also lives um, close by 
they're moving their mother to Northampton so that she can be a full-fledged member of our senior center. So I think that's a compliment to the staff and I think it's a compliment to um, the city that somebody would look at our senior center in such a respectful way. Um, on page three, oh, let's see, three uh, and four, it lists our uh, profit centers, which dining services, which includes coffee shop, the bistro, special dining, that's when we offer continental breakfast or um, special uh, luncheons. We've put on the food for conferences and we can uh, bring an income from that. Of course, it takes a lot of extra work by everybody to do that. Again, we have wonderful volunteers, but the staff has to get involved. And so you can look through there and see uh, what some of the income has been for those profit centers, um, both for FY11 and FY12. And of course, we haven't finished FY12, so we uh, did it with an expectation of uh, the 12 months there. And then uh, you'll see on page four the fitness center, and that gives you some indication of how wonderful that is and we have people joining all the time and it's great to see all the retired well, not all of them but a majority of uh, retired teachers and individuals coming in not just from Northampton but we also have 25 slots for those who are 55 and older from other communities as well building rentals um, as you know we have the opportunity to offer space and uh, here it's listed for FY11 and F12, um, FY12 for what the uh, net profit has been. And when you see the 1% to central services, that's what CS stands for, um, though we haven't shifted that, the transfer of that money over. Um, on the back of that page, you can see the building use. It's a building that is well utilized. There are people in and out of that building. Um, every day and I will say that uh, we have just done a survey which you're going to see a copy in here and um, one of the major things that I'm finding on the survey is people would like the senior center to be open longer hours be open on weekends and as I explained to people that all has to do with resources staff resources and the revenue to keep it open so it, we do need to look at that it's always been a goal in a mission of the senior center because we have a lot of seniors who continue to work um, one because they like to but two out of necessity and um, they would like something to be offered to them that's in the evening and um, you'll see that in the narrative that that's one of the the objectives to try to offer something um, long term for people on weekends and uh, evenings so that's all I can tell you because I don't know how much more that could really involve, but that's, that's on the radar. Um, the, the National Volunteer Month was last month. We had our, uh, our recognition uh, dinner. And just to point out that our volunteers, about 175 of them, um, all of who have to be interviewed, they have about an hour and a half of uh, orientation and training, a quarry check, and then uh, ongoing supervision, 15,062.25 hours, which I think is pretty incredible. And, you know, we have volunteers who come and go, but we have a good steady force of volunteers who do a whole variety of things within the um, senior center. We also have interns coming from area colleges, we have students from local schools, and we have some of the um, charter schools doing a variety of things with us um, off and on throughout the year. So we try to make the experience open for people of all ages. Then there's just a calendar that we put out for some of the special events going on um, each month. And I also put in there a copy of the business managers um, job description, which as you all know, um, I do have an issue with uh, the elimination of that position. And um, I know it's it's a done deal, um, but I wouldn't be a good department head if I didn't advocate for that position. And um, the, the influence and uh, what kind of consequence it could have um, <coughs> relating to seniors. Um, Council of the Barge first and then Thank Council you. Adams. Um, Patty, so you have, what, seven salaried employees? There, there are 10 employees 
Five of them are full-time, which is 35 hours, and then five of them are anywhere between seven hours a month to um, 20, 30 hours. So it ranges okay. for part-time. On page 72, on the home repair inspector, mm -hmm. Yes. how many hours is that? It's seven hours a month. Seven hours a month? And, and let me just say, too, that Can that's... Can we pay him? He, he only gets paid when we need him. When we and and him. what he does is he's part of our home repair program, which okay. is funded through CDBG. The business manager um, for seven hours is the person who operates this, that program. And he comes in only when we need him to do a, um, an inspection of a home to determine if, in fact, we can do a loan or a grant to that, okay. that homeowner. Um, that position originally was a standalone position for 20 hours. and. For a number of years, I tried to get that changed because we didn't need somebody for 20 hours. There, it was a union issue. Um, but finally, that position became what it is now um, with the business manager. And, and what the home repair program does is allow, you know, our purpose is for people to age in place so that they can stay in their homes. And, you know, some of them are major projects like roof um, replacement, um, bathroom updating, anything that's good for um, safety and just to be updated. It could be the electrical uh, wiring, um, things like that. Okay. Also, um, in 2012, you received a grant for transporting seniors, correct? Yes. To and from the senior center. Yes. How many would you say actually use that transportation? That program hasn't started yet. When uh, is it starting? Well, it was going to start um, in June, but um, that was going to be w one of the functions of the business manager. So now that whole thing's getting revamped. And so I don't know who's going to run it. Um, I know who can do some of the scheduling, but that piece hasn't been fully put together. We did receive a grant. We have $7,000 from Highland Valley Elder Services to um, have a program to bring seniors to and from the senior center so they can take advantage of programs and services. So that money um, we will have um, and hopefully up and running by um, June 1st still. So I, I can't answer it any more than that, um, Counselor. So you were actually depending on a business manager but, to run that part of it, of transportation? Right. I, I think, and this is probably true in many departments, but I'm not speaking for them. I'm only speaking for the Council yeah. on Aging, that um, many staff do a variety of things that are somewhat related to what they do. And in this case, with the business manager in medical, um, with um, the transportation to and from the senior center, there's a lot of finances that are dealing with that. But somebody needed to spearhead it and be in charge of it, to be that coordinator. And that was going to fall to the business manager. Do you think because of this position not being filled, that there will actually be problem at the senior center by not having that position are you going to actually see what's the word I want to use you are the director you they're keeping the assistant director right. by removing the business managers position what effect is it going to have on the senior center well I mean you deal with a business manager for how long um, well, we've had a business manager since um, 2009 was when it was first um, advertised. And the person, Arlene Murnane, was our first business manager. She started in January of 2010. Okay, so we don't have one right now, but we'll have you an assistant administrator, correct? The assistant director. Yeah. So how are the two of you going to go ahead and fill that position together. But it's, I, I'd like to hear that. Um, because this is something new now. It, it is. So as the department head, I have to figure out how it's all going to work and what parts of it can work. And obviously, if that business manager is working 24 hours, where is all that going to fall? And um, if and you know, let's just divide those hours in half. If I'm taking half of them, then something else needs to give. And so it's figuring out what, again, looking at the mission, what are the essential functions of what we should be doing, what are we going to 
not do anymore because it's really not meeting the mission. It might be a nice courtesy, it might be a nice uh, opportunity or you know a convenience, but those things are all going to get looked at, especially if there's some kind of finance, some kind of money, uh, revenue coming in that really doesn't have much to do with us in terms of our budget. So all of that will get looked at. Um, and other than coming up with a lot of scenarios, um, we have a board meeting on Thursday. It will be presented to the board um, for discussion. And then I would imagine that in the June meeting, unless there's a special board meeting, that um, the decisions will be made about what would be uh, eliminated or altered. Also, Patty, I heard you talk about <laughs> the eight revolving funds that you have. Can you explain, and I'm talking about like a business manager, would she also be involved handling the revolving funds? She handles all of anything financial in our department, she handles so, the monitoring of the, I'm sorry, the monitoring of grants okay. and all the revolving accounts. I'm trying to get all this into my head. Where, I want you to explain the comparison of the revolving funds and why you feel that it is actually needed to have that business manager placed back at the senior center. Because of the eight revolving funds that you have, there is a comparison apparently from the senior center to other departments that have revolving funds, correct? Right, and, and I do apologize. It was my impression from what I looked up that um, the uh, rec department had two revolving accounts. They have three. Um, but I think we have multiple, you know, and there could be $15 in that revolving account or there can be $90,000. you are still having to handle that. And if anything, the business manager has the, the, the knowledge and the experience of putting all of that together and being able to provide financial reports to the board to me, to whoever comes in and says, well, how many people do you have with your medical transportation program? And I can say, based on what the business manager comes up with in terms of the money that's come in from that, as well as how many uh, medical transportation rides we have, uh, 844. I think I'd have to look at my notes, but it's it's a high number. So finally, we have a handle on everything that we're doing, and you know we're all supposed to be accountable. And how much more accountable can you be with a person who's doing all of that? And it, it's it's a it's a high level uh, position, and that that is what was determined when we moved to the senior center that it wasn't just us being over there in Memorial Hall with the less than 5,000 square feet and a few programs here and a couple um, funds going, it, it, this, is, this is a big enterprise down there, and I'm not sure um, where everybody thinks all this money comes from all the time, and I think we earn it. Right, and you have a tremendous amount of volunteers down there that help save money and do such a great job, and I think you as a director also <clears throat> have come a long way with that senior center, and it's very, very pleasant when you go down there. And I know, and you know, Patty, how many seniors I just have on my ward mm -hmm. that do volunteer work for it, and, you know, and they praise what goes on. Yeah, and we wouldn't be able to do um, everything that we do if we didn't have volunteers. So they're equally as important at the senior center as they are in the school department. Uh, Councilor Adamson, Councilor Freeman Daniels. A couple of quick questions here. The, for this assistant director position, $41,550, that reflects the increased salary? Yeah. I, I have to yes. say that I, 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 that's true, but I don't really know much about it. Okay, and um, it, is it currently vacant or is it held by Ms. Cruz Soth? I'm sorry? Is it currently vacant or is it held by Ms. Cruz Soth, just because I see it, her name? It's on um, vacant. She left for another position. Okay. okay. And just, um, I think maybe for the mayor or the finance director, which departments um, have... A, a, a position of uh, budget director, if you if you could. Uh, there's only three departments in the city School. that have a business manager: Northampton Public Schools, Smith Vocational, and the DPW, um, and formerly the Senior okay. Center. Thank you. Johnson, Council Council Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Um, I just was hoping to get a little bit of a breakdown on these numbers here. Um, the building use from yeah. 2000 for 2011. 
Is that round trip? I mean, what is what is that? Like January had two thousand three hundred ninety-four watts. Is that people number out? a is number that? of people coming in? Okay, so and that's... that number is probably much higher because we ask people to sign in when they come in, and we know a lot of people choose not to do that. And then when there are other events in the building, it includes those people as well. So if there is a um, Ward Three committee meeting in there, and there are uh, 20 people, those 20 people would be counted in who uses the building. They would be counted in this, but some, but anyone who doesn't sign in obviously doesn't. Right. So we're all getting that My Senior Center, which is a great um, opportunity for us, like uh, many other uh, senior centers, that will be able to uh, log people better. People will not need to sign in unless they don't have a scan card. So we're going to be able to get a lot of statistics and um, come up with every single name, um, get pictures in the, um, the system of who the senior is. There's just so many great features of that My Senior Center. So when we actually get that installed, um, the contracts are being signed now. Um, I will invite all of you down to see the wonderful characteristics of the My Senior Center. Unfortunately, it won't do anything to help us uh, financially in terms of you know what a what a person and the business manager was going to manage the um, My Senior Center. <laughs> <coughs> the, it, it doesn't, you can't pay the machine for your, your class or you can't pay for a ticket. You have to still deal with a person. It can get logged in the um, My Senior Center uh, component software that you paid for it, but there's still a transaction that's separate from the um, My Senior Center. I went off tangent, but it's just part of it. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I just wanted just to break these down a little bit. So. If the senior center is roughly open 21 days a month, right, five days a week, um, and sometimes weekends and evenings, we have programs. All right. So then, taking an average of the months used uh, usage, it's an average of about um, 2,663 for 2011, and uh, that comes out to roughly speaking 122 people per day. Um, so th then what I wanted to know about was the volunteer hours. Mm -hmm. um, the average, again, in 2011 was 12, 000, uh, 1,255 hours. So that's um, roughly per day, 58 hours a day per, for volunteers at the senior center. Mm -hmm. So 58 hours for volunteers and on average 122 people being served. So that's a, I mean, can you tell me if that's a high ratio of volunteer hours to service? Um, do I think it's high? Yeah. No. Um, we have volunteers in an average day. There are two um, in the coffee shop, two shifts. At the front desk, there would be six volunteers, two different shifts. In the gift shop, there's two. And then if the bistro's open, there's um, anywhere between six and 11 volunteering and some of them come in at 8 30 and they're there till 8 30. and then there are people doing a variety of other things doing the library um, vacuuming floors doing windows doing uh, you know a whole variety of things for uh, the usage i mean the, the amount of usage is that do you feel i mean i guess it's a question about budgets and for volunteers it's no budget for them but is that the is that the best use of their time, or is it? Can it be done that you have volunteers working in the evenings in order to keep the senior center open for the evenings? Or we actually do use volunteers and a building monitor and or, or a staff person. But I, I, because the largest portion of the population uses that building during the day, it's very difficult to pull a staff person off. But we also have building monitors who get scheduled to be in there. But we also do use volunteers. And, and the policy of the board is that there's always a staff person or a building monitor when the building is open. So I don't know, am I answering your question? Yes, volunteers do help. Um, like tonight, there's um, a volunteer down there um, running the coffee shop with the um, Hampshire Coral Society there. There's a yoga class going on and we have our social worker who now has evening hours because of that need and she's there from six to eight. So. Thank you. Uh, one more question about the building rentals then. Um, 
what do you what so so how do those work out? I mean, it seems as though there was a shrink. There's a shrinkage in 2011 from 2012. Uh, although we're not totally done with 2012, it looks as though there's either less usage or just less amount being charged. Um, well, it, it is probably that the great room is where we make most of our money. Um, so if somebody's just renting one of the rooms, it's $30. And if they're renting the great room and they're using food, it's $125 an hour. So there's a variation with that. So you just think this is just variation between FY11 and 12? Right. And I can't convince people to rent the senior center. I mean, a lot of people think they should be able to come in and use it for absolutely nothing. Can and sure, I can, no, no. Um, because we're CDBG funded um, for five years and I still haven't gotten when that ends so that this senior center can be used in different ways, but it's um, programming for seniors, low and moderate um, income, and also community events that reflect um, something for seniors. That's who can use it. We've got some great, great rentals in there, great uh, events, and it does help us. It's a lot of work to do a rental. But we enjoy people coming into our building because it's important for the community and anybody to know what a senior center is and what a senior center does. So we try to be proactive with who we are. Any other questions? Patty, thank you so much for the presentation. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I always enjoy speaking about the senior center. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Patty. And thank you, board members, for coming in as well. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to take a, a yes. brief break. Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, no one does. Sorry. Under the health care break well. in five minutes. Uh, next up at the podium, we're going to hear from the tax collector's office, Lisa Lamprin, not available tonight. In her stead. The assistant, she Debbie Dunphy. Pulled the short, yeah, she pulled the short straw for this. <laughs> yes. And, uh, um, do you want to give a presentation, though, to, or do you want? I'll do a quick little overview. Sure. Why don't and you anybody do that? can ask any Great. questions. Um, so basically, right now, the I'll start with the collector side. We have five people in our office. We're fully staffed right now. We have the collector, the assistant, and three principal clerks. The assistant is brand new to that position, but I've been here almost 17 years, so I'm learning that job, trying to help Melissa do her part of the bargain. And we have three brand new principal clerks who we are trying to train on a daily basis and keep everything going and flowing and keeping everything on time. So we're busy doing that function. Um, we have our Unipay website up and running, and people are starting to use that more which is beneficial for the city instead of the online checks, which is very, very cumbersome. What we're trying to do now, Melissa's looking into credit and debit cards, and we're gonna try to have a system on our computer on the counter and maybe one of the desks, maybe mine, where they could come in, use the credit debit, it would cost, I mean, it would cost the person <coughs> money. And I think she's trying to also set that up on our Unipay website. So right now the Unipay <coughs> is using your checking account. I think this would be able to use debit credit. We're looking for that maybe July. So that's what we're doing on our side. Everything is up to date. We're keeping up with the demands and warrants on excise taxes. Tax title's been done. So we're up to date on the things that we need to do. In the parking clerk's office, of course, that is all changing currently. Um, Melissa is now in charge of the three and a half parking enforcement officers, payroll, and everything that pertains to them. Parking passes are now being done by the parking clerk's office. The accomplice has a new system set up where the parking passes are done into that system. They are also taking over the meter bags. So there's a lot of volume with that, a lot of traffic doing that type of thing. So everybody's trying to cover doing the different aspects of the parking garage. Right now we have the temporary, the parking person from the garage is temporarily between the parking clerk and our office. That's basically where we're at right now. I, I personally am very grateful for the prospect of being able to pay with my debit card. We've <laughs> a lot of people I know do. That my wife and, and this have been frequent communications. So it's a so frequently asked question. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> they want their frequent flyer miles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So that you should. We're looking into it. Oh, looking into it. Yeah. Uh, Council of Barge. Thank you. Um, reading on the budget book, there's been an increase of what two thousand eight hundred in your collector's budget, and this is due to the cost of your crystal reports, is that correct? Crystal reports is the report that we use to do the bid bills right now. So that's what? Uh, the business, in, yeah, the business improvement district, yes. Okay. And also the reduction in the parking enforcement budget of $8,065. Right. Well, they've, they're going to eliminate the parking clerk's position that's in the garage, which is Cindy Parsons, and they've hired a half-time parking person. So I'm not quite sure what the 8000 is because I'm not really involved in that part of it. Maybe Susan, Susan might the mayor might. Thank you. The, the um, parking enforcement budget is separate from the parking maintenance. Can you, can you speak of the microphone? I'm sorry for oh. folks at home that... The uh, parking enforcement budget and the parking maintenance budget are two different budgets. The, um, the position that Cindy Parsons had was in the parking maintenance. So the change in this budget is just due to some rearrangement of parking enforcement officer hours. Um, there was one person who was in the parking maintenance side, uh, Beaupre. He was one full-time person in the parking maintenance. What we did is we moved him. 50% PEO and 50% maintenance. So we brought him over, which allowed us to reduce some of the part-time PEO. Yeah. So it's basically shifting some maintenance staff over to a PEO responsibility. because He works the night shift at the parking garage, and so what we'd like him to do um, come July is start doing more ticketing of um, after-hours ticketing for like handicap parking illegally, those kinds of things that we haven't been ticketing as much for. And what's the hour? He works 3 to 11, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Council Lou, why you I'm all set, thank you. Any other questions? Any questions relative to uh, parking enforcement, transition systems, uh, <coughs> collections? Uh, Your Honor. I just wanted to make a comment. You want, you want to do that in the microphone? Sure. It's, it's just a, but that's what came in. It was just a comment that I wanted to thank uh, the assistant collector and, and uh, the, the collector herself, Lisa Lampert, who's not here tonight. Um, this parking thing kind of has been uh, sort of thrust on them on not a lot of notice, and they've really picked it up, and uh, the staff there has, has absorbed this and learned the new systems and tried to incorporate the sale of par parking passes and other things into their system. Um, and, and really, I think that it's been flawless from the public's viewpoint that, that we haven't had any uh, diminution of service or and we, and we've, um, in fact, I think had improved service. Uh, so I just <laughs> wanted to thank you publicly and thank Lissa and, and the rest of the staff for taking on this additional responsibility without any uh, increase in their budget to reflect that. So. Uh, Council Spector. Uh, Mayor, I, I just have a question for you. One of the things that the, um, when we, ha when Bill the Tender was here, was he was helpful in terms of when we had ordinances and other things, kind of interpreting, because some of that is, you know, gets a little challenging to do. Would we go to the DPW as counselors or come to their office? How, or uh, just yeah. on our own with all of that? No, I think what, I think really, um, uh, and this is true, it's in the ordinance. The, the, um, really, I think the Transportation and Parking Commission was always intended to be kind of the collection point for these kinds of issues. Okay. Because it was designed in a way that it brought not only the parking, but it also brought the police, the DPW, and planning, all four of those. So we parties. should all call Councillor Tacey whenever yeah. we have I'm not a saying that. What I'm saying is the chair, depending, the chair of the. No, I wouldn't say that. I think that, <laughs> that depending on the nature of the parking <laughs> issue, whether it's a strict policy issue, whether it's a signs missing, um, that we'll try to get that, you know, directed to the right. Because parking is, you know, there's different aspects of it that are right. handled by, by different four different departments, really. Um, and now we're adding uh, central services as well. So 
the whole idea of the transportation and parking commission was to kind of have a holistic look at it and every anything having to do with parking is supposed to come through that body so okay so it might be helpful and and it, very specifically for us as counselors because i know i use Mr. Lertender, quite a bit for a number of issues as kind of the triage person. Mm -hmm. Who would we call on transportation parking? Who's the? Uh, well, I think probably if you had, um, I have to I have to work out with them because I know they're in a little bit of a transition point around the staff issue that we're going to try to figure out. Because right okay. now there's been temporary staffing of that committee, and I'm looking to have something a little more okay. uh, permanent or city staff oriented. So that's another conversation we have to have okay. for the beginning of the year, fiscal year. But I do think that um, depending on the nature of it, um, going through the going through the committee and then having, uh, having the committee filter it to the right person, we can try to work on a system for doing that. Okay. Um, you, you but in the meantime, you can certainly contact my office and we'll try to make sure it gets to work. Okay. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think Melissa and Deborah would really want to. No, no, no. They're I'll definitely not. <laughs> no, no, definitely that's not their bailiwick. Although, you know, if there was an enforcement issue, then right. Uh, right. then that certainly those kinds of calls. If there's a broken meter, that's going to go to maintenance. I mean, that's always been. Um, the, the clearinghouse point where do we call your office and then. If, in, in the, the time, time being, until we can get the structure uh, worked out for, for sort of the these larger policy issues yeah we'll, we can definitely do that but I mean there were a lot of things that were happening you know uh, the park parking in Leeds or Florence or in, you know on on your street technically is was is actually more within the purview of the DPW than the parking director because we didn't have any meters we didn't have any um, parking division infrastructure there per se so it was always kind of a blurring of the DPW the parking police, et cetera. And that's what the whole TPC was designed, was to try to bring all those things together. So, okay. Okay, thanks. So, Deborah, your department's been level funded, yet at the same time you guys have assumed a substantial uh, responsibility. You, you, you seem frighteningly cheerful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's not much else you can do. You come, you do your job, you do the job the best you can do. That's you know, that's the way of it. You know, you go to work and you're, you're focused. You know, I have certain things I have to do, and that's what I do. And we just go in and do our job. What a revelation, uh, yeah, Council of Arts. Debbie, I want to thank Melissa, you, all your staff, and I have to commend you because, like the mayor had stated, everything just happened very quickly here, and to take in another department. It's a lot of it's work. Lot. Yeah. And I know when I go in there, everybody's always smiling. Everybody, you just feel very welcome in there, and that's important. My question is, with the four clerical <laughs> that you do have, and this move was made from parking into Melissa's office, your, your department, right. how did the clerical work? besides doing their own department and then having another new department added on to them. Was everybody working like cross-training? Basically, the three employees in our office, the three principal clerks, don't have anything to do with the parking at all. Okay. That's Melissa's a supervisor of, of everybody, and then in her absence, I'm the supervisor. They, the parking enforcement officers, go through her time cards go through us I do the payroll or Jean does the payroll so we control the, their time sheets we had to do the time sheets they come to us if they want time off they go to Melissa um, if they have any questions pertaining to that that goes to Melissa the meter bags and the parking passes all that has gone onto the parking clerk's office okay. Nancy and Jean have assumed that type of a role that hasn't affected Melissa's in my department every morning when the parking um, Brian and Michael come in with the money. Now there's a little different thing that I have to do every morning with, you know, calculating the money. I have to sign off on different sheets, so it's a little bit more time for me in the morning getting that ready and signing it off. Then they have to give that to the central services because we need to account for everything the way it's going, and that it's accounted for properly. So that's a little bit more for me. It's not a heck of a lot, but it's a little bit more. And everybody's trying to adjust, and some people are happy about it, some aren't happy about it. But it's it's what you have to do. It hasn't been a problem. So for me personally, or Alyssa personally, the supervisory part for Melissa has been more 
it's been more of a burden for her. The rest of my department has not had any okay. any issues with it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any any more questions for Debbie? I mean, she was terrified about coming in. So I mean, we, we have to. Bet I was. <laughs> to give her some you did great. You Thank you. Here, I think. It's not so much you. It's being on TV. Oh well, trust uh, me. No one's watching. Very <laughs> I'm used to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um. Well, good. Thank you, Deb. That's, okay. I appreciate it, and and I'll listen to get better quick. I will tell her that. I'm and sure she'll be And thank you again. I'm going to reiterate. Thank you again for uh, for actually very proactively uh, and progressively taking on additional challenges and doing it. At, and and I know that you can see this coming. So this was. I mean, other people knew that there was going to be a short budget. No one knew that they were going to assume a whole other department. And, and you guys, you did it with a plum, so thank you. Melissa does a great job. <coughs> yes, she does. Thank <clears throat> you. Hopefully thank I answered your questions. I think thank you, you did. Thank you, Thanks. Thank you. Next up, Vanessa. Vanessa Siller? There she is. Where she lives. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm going to be brief, and then uh, it's open for question. Um, basically, there are three things or two things that are the highlights in the budget or the changes that are there was a part time position in FY12 that is eliminated in FY13. Uh, I never consider it necessary because there, there's going to be a full time position that was supposed to cover DPW, but DPW is funding fully a position that I'll be supervising uh, for FY13. So the part time position was unnecessary, so we eliminated it. Uh, there's a position, again, full-time position at DPW that's not in my budget. It's in their budget, so it's not reflected in, in the budget nar narrative for narrative for MIS. Um, I don't consider we need more people. I think we need the right people. Um, the other big issue is, or major issue, is the munis on the cloud. The munis is the financial system that every department in the city uses. And throughout the year, they have been changing the technology, making it more complicated. Um, it's critical. And so the city made a decision to go for their cloud services. And cloud services mean that we don't get servers here. The servers are on their facilities. So they access to the system through the internet. Um, so that, those are the two major changes on the budget. Um, I just want to mention in terms of uh, we make plans for what are we going to be dealing through the year, and then things happen. Like right now we had, uh, I think the mayor has to certify now every year when they apply for, when the city or the schools apply for grants, they have to certify that the city and or schools comply with executive order, state executive order 504. Um, so that kind of fell on my lap. We're looking at that. It's a lot of requirement. We have been proactive in meeting a lot of the requirements before they even issue the the executive order. So we are a step ahead in that sense. There are other things that we need to look at from the city perspective. So what will happen is that there will have to be a combined effort between the city and the schools. So that when the major signs were in compliance, uh, if it's a grant for the city, then it's the city is compliant. If it's a grant for the school, then the schools are compliant. Uh, so that's one of the things that we, we didn't plan for it just happened and uh, it's a big 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 project because the more i research it the more requirements uh, appear uh, i don't know the financial impact on that i think that most of the thing we probably could do with what we have is just implementing a lot of it, policies and procedures and enforcing them um one of the thing we do is like uh, last year we got uh, the northampton prevent coalition they came to our office, they just dropped by, and we ended up helping them setting up their, the, kind of pushing them to the right direction, how to set up their website on, on a low cost basis. So there are many things that we do that are not planned. It just people come and things happen. Um, so if there are any questions. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Is Hi, thank you um, for, the, for this uh, presentation. I just have a question. In the narrative, you said uh, indicate that the phone system software will need to be upgraded. 
Yes. Is this the um, is this the uh, over internet protocol system? That yeah, we have an over purchased? the internet protocol voice over IP system. And when you have servers and you have uh, software, things change. And one thing that happened is that in two, about a year and a half ago or two years ago, the company was 3Com, and that was acquired by HP, and now HP is pushing on their direction, so they're setting the rules now. So we have to migrate to the new version by uh, March of next year in order to be able to buy phones. But the, the phone that we have right now won't be supported anymore. Uh, my understanding is that we only need to upgrade the server software. It's going to be backward compatible with the software on the phones, so the phone that we have will keep working. It's just if we need a new one somewhere, <coughs> then we need to be on the latest release. So this was a if I recall right, this was an expensive purchase a few years yes. ago. Yes. Um, what's the, <coughs> I mean, is there any process that MIS can go through in the next year or year and a half that we have to keep on upgrading the software and keep on, you know, we, we don't fall uh, victim to the vicissitudes of corporate buyouts and bankruptcies and so on? That's a good one because we have the same issue with the email archive. HP bought the company also, and the transition was a nightmare, uh, which happened this year. Um, the only alternative I can think of, top of my head right now is either go back to what we had, Centrix, or go to a, a hosted cloud system from some other company. And the issue with hosted system is that they can be expensive. So when you have um, system that you're acquiring here, the, the, the expenses are capital investments. So it could, they're funded from capital funds, capital projects. When you go to the cloud, you're shifting the cost from capital to operating budget. So as long as there's a commitment from the city to fund the operating budget, uh, that's doable. Thank you. Uh, in, you're right, and the transition to a cloud would, of course, require a substantial upfront investment with with a realization of well, hopefully, and I'm going to, this is actually a question mark, a long term reduction in maintenance, oversight, upgrades, support, and all that, right? Yeah, uh, if I recall correctly, when we got the bits for the phone, and I might be confused between the phone and the wire and network, there was one hosted solution, and I think it was like a million dollars a year or something like that, or a hundred thousand dollars a year, and that was for more than one year. That was their proposal. And, uh, there was another hosted solution, and I don't recall, but it was also more expensive. And it was kind of an obscure company. Right. So we have to be careful also to go with reputable, not obscure, because sometimes an obscure company might meet some the requirement, but then they are fly by nights also. So, uh, yes, and that's, uh, I, once again, talking about the vicissitudes of uh, corporate buyouts, but if you went to the Google the uh, Google uh, app for government, Google getting bought out, the prospects of that. Oh, no, I don't think that would happen. Likely. I might be wrong. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that's more likely. <laughs> we will be bought out by Google. The, um, currently, do you, uh, I mean, and, and this is sort of like doing the munis to the cloud is kind of like dipping your toe in that water, though, isn't it? It's sort of the... It, 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 I would assume that once once we make the successful transition, that that means less work with duct tape on the servers down in the basement, as you guys wade through the water to get to the server, and <laughs> and, yeah. and all the other challenge associated challenges. I mean, it was certainly brought to light with the big crash that came earlier this year. Um, do you expect that that transition is going to benefit your office in any way ultimately? Um. Yes and no. In terms of the, the having to go and request funds for replacement, server replacement, and but the server replacement also has licenses that are involved. So we're talking maybe thirty, forty thousand uh, dollars when that happens. And in terms of the Muni's uh, support, like running the payroll and things like that, that doesn't change. Uh, what we are doing, we never had a, what they call the OSDBA contract operating system and database administration, and we never have uh, disaster recovery services either. Those are 
contracts above and beyond of the support contract we have. Uh, so the cloud solution includes those optional uh, contracts or services which will be really useful in recovering from when there's a problem. And the other, the other advantage also is that through a secure connection as published, I haven't seen it, but as published, if somebody is sick from home or they have, or the finance director, for example, have to work from home someday, so there's a secure way. Um, the payroll will still print here, but there's the, because they have the disaster recovery, something happens, uh, they, can, uh, they, they have, they have uh, state-of-the-art centers so they have a backup center, I think it's Texas. Um, so if something happens in Maine, they can fall back to their backup in Texas, which is good for its disaster because you don't want your disaster recovery data center to be in the same geographical area. Uh, what we have right now, we have like a server here in the fire department, which never being optional, uh, I'm sorry, optimal because that's less than two miles. They said for a minimum it should be, they used to say two miles since Katrina, now it is like, out of the region. Well, it's, and you, um, the, the other consequence of this, or that um, done backup, you were having all the um, the desktop systems backing up to the main server. When the server crashed, there was no auxiliary backup for some. I, I, I remember Susan actually didn't have a backup system, so she had no way that, that she didn't have an external hard drive backup, for instance, that could allow her to. To, to access to, to uh, I think it was kind of critical at that point of developing the budget. So the cloud system allows the kind of security that you would normally get if, if you didn't have desktop backup. Yeah, it, it is secure. And I think for me, at least very important also that it's based in the United States. They are not hosting in China or right. somewhere else, Pakistan. <laughs> um, <laughs> So it's hosted in the United States, and that's one of the things we looked at. We do have cloud uh, things in the cloud right now, like the website is on the cloud. That's not hosted internally. So we have some toes in the water for a while with certain things. Uh, this, was, this is the biggest one. Uh, Councilor Adam. Um, Ms. Quindle, how long have you been the director? Uh, 15, 16 years, not sure. Would you happen to recall why the the budget of the department went from about two hundred eighty thousand in two thousand nine to about four hundred ten thousand in twenty ten and about yes, and I'm glad I was watching earlier because I saw somebody asking somebody about that and I said well, let me Probably. find my background <laughs> yes uh, one of those years we the person a staff person from Central Services was transferred to MIA when we went to the new phone system. Uh, it, she held the position of city messenger and communication supervisor. So she was transferred to MIA. I always want the opinion that probably it should have been a shared position, the the mail service that should have stayed in central services, but it was transferred completely. With that came the budget for the phones and postage into MIS. Uh, in FY12, the person retired and Post, postage, the mailing function went back to central services, so there was a transfer of six, about $68,000 to them. I think that explained the big differences. Yeah, but the, the from 29 to 2010, it was, it went up uh, about 110000 or so. Mm. Yeah, there were $68,000 for postage around, about there was the staff person that we picked up, and there was also the telephone that was that came also to us. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions for Vanessa? How was that? Not too bad. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I spent the whole. I spent most of the day at the treatment plant, so I was like, oh, I haven't prepared. <laughs> No, I was preparing before. Thank you. Fine. Thank, Thank you, you very much. That sentence seems about right. Louis, are you prepared to come up early? Yes. All right. Yes. Louis. Oh, we're still having a question. Oh, I'm so, which counselor? Oh, Marianne? Oh, Vanessa, I'm sorry. And oh, Louis, I'm sorry. sorry. Marianne, I'm I'm very sorry. Uh, uh, counsel Vanessa, Bartes. I want to thank you for everything that you do in the city. And plus, the fact is, many people before, that's why I've always had you come in. 
never knew what your department was all about because you're so hidden down there in a little area by yourself that I want to thank you for being Thanks. Here. And by the way, people have asked me about the encrypted email. You can delete them. You don't need to read them. <laughs> yeah. It was a test. It was a test. <laughs> Thank I got you. It. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh, Thank you. Louis, now you're up. Thank you. Building Commission. Oh, all right. Do you want do you want to give a little presentation first and then we'll uh, we'll fill you you're, you're up for that? Sure. Well, uh, I'd like to start with the fact that we're presenting an absolute level budget this year. We're not asking for more. Um, not that we wouldn't like to, um, but uh, I, we feel I feel we can get through the, the year with a with a level budget. Actually, give back three hundred dollars. I think we did it on purpose, but that's how the numbers added up. I couldn't find a way to stuff three hundred back in. Um, the uh, the revenues for FY12 from the building department are going to be less than they've been in the past. I expect that we're going to end up about $75,000 shorter this year than we were last year. Um, it, uh, it's a blip, I think. Um, I've looked back at the revenues over a number of years, and this year dropped off significantly. And uh, the biggest difference has been the larger scale projects. I, we've seen that the, um, the numbers of projects uh, with the estimated construction costs of over a million dollars are pretty much non-existent in uh, FY12. It's not, um, it's, it, I don't expect it to stay that way. We're seeing um, projects in the pipeline that I expect that'll come forward in FY13 that will bring us right back up. I've done an estimate based on the last five years, but giving a lot of extra weight to the revenues from this year and come up with uh, <coughs> bringing our revenues about back to where they were for FY11. I don't think they'll get to the levels they got to in uh, FY7, um, but um, where there was a tremendous amount of construction, I think $105 million worth of construction in Northampton um, in, in FY7. I expect that we'll probably end up somewhere around 35 or 40 million dollars in FY13. We're going to replace two of our key personnel in uh, FY13. The George Fournier, the inspector of wires, is retiring at the end of this month, and then our plumbing inspector Larry Lapine is retiring at the end of December. Um, I think that's going to be. Those are going to be two difficult positions to fill. Um, both of the inspectors are very experienced. They're uh, quite knowledgeable about commercial work, and we do a lot of commercial work in Northampton. It's not, you know, one family, bathroom renovations, new houses. It's it's fairly it's quite sophisticated. The, um, just the electrical system in the uh, police station is uh, sort of a classic example of that. It's, there's a redundancy built into it, very sophisticated controls. And I mean, honestly, Northampton's pay scales aren't, aren't going to attract the brightest and best. Um, we're behind a lot of the surrounding communities in terms of what, we, what our pay scales offer. Um, that said, it's a great department, and we're going to plug hard for the privilege of working in Northampton, which uh, goes a long ways. It's surprising, but by, uh, in some ways, it's surprising to me. But, but uh, because I'm here and I look around, and uh, I know why I want to work here. Sometimes I don't understand why other people would come, but um, we do get good people, and we've got the last two people we've hired have been excellent. So, so we have to count on people as deluded as you, <laughs> <laughs> or, as, <laughs> or as or as invested in the community. And That's what I meant. You just yeah. have to find it. <laughs> um, the, my budget is is it's real straightforward. It's absolutely bare bones. Um, I'm not sure if we could cut any more. It's uh, it's been difficult to. You know, especially in our the ordinary maintenance, it's been difficult to maintain, to keep providing the services with with a budget that um, 
has been level. It's gone down from previous years. It's level from last year. And the costs are, are ahead of where they were last year. I mean, it costs more to buy gasoline. It costs more to, um, you know, to do almost anything. Um, but we've been um, looking very carefully at what we spend our money on and figuring out things that we could you know, afford to not have this year or afford to not to put off uh, for a year or two. Our uh, personal services, um, if I didn't anticipate that we'll have, I, I, I built the budget around level funding for the two positions that we're going to have to replace. George Fournier has been here a while. He's uh, in the upper portion of his um, salary range, but I believe that we won't be able to replace him for anything less than that. Um, and uh, I'll have to wait and see what happens in December, but I think we may be hard pressed to replace our plumbing inspector for what we're paying the one we have now. I, I just don't think there's another one of those out there. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor Carney. Is that a, is that, I mean, 30 hours a week, it's not really part time, but I mean, what is that? Um, well, it's, uh, it's, yeah, against 35, which is our regular, uh, our regular schedule. Um, most of us work more than 35 hours a week. I mean, that's part of how we've been able to make it work is that we have very committed staff. Thank you. Councilor Carney. Um, yeah, I understand your point about replacing, given the, the wage that you have here, um, which is, you know, considerably less, even on a full-time basis, that somebody might make out in the field um, just working as an electrician. But, uh, um, so my question is, uh, what is the um, sort of, uh, what would be required beyond a master's license do you need to have a, a certification in inspection? No, there isn't. For electrical inspectors, it's, there's no certification for, okay. for inspection. There is a certification for the plumbing inspector beyond the license. But you do need a master's electric, um, master electrician license? You don't even need a master's license. No? It can be a journeyman's license. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, our department's need, though, is for a very experienced person, someone who yeah. is, is comfortable and knowledgeable of, of, about commercial work who can uh, approach a project like the uh, police department or uh, Smith College is going to go forward with some uh, replacing some of the um, some of their emergency generator systems and switch gear and uh, it's I mean it's way way over my head um, so you're really looking for somebody with industrial or commercial yeah. experience yeah, yeah. Compared, I, the we're just going to have to we've we'll put it we'll do a search. We'll also we we've also gone over lists of all the electrical contractors that we deal with uh, through our system, mm -hmm. and then uh, George Fournier teaches uh, Update. classes in uh, for um, continuing ed, and we've gone over his list, and we're going to go out and try to you know invite people to apply as opposed to just throwing it out there and seeing who we get um, and try to put a lot of energy into the one-on-one -on -one, you know invitation and you know really pump up the place uh, think of the money you'll save you get a parking placard just about the um, your code enforcer is that the building inspector yeah we have a the there's there's myself the assistant commissioner and then a uh, local inspector slash code enforcement officer. And that's uh, the Brenda Church. Okay. Um, so, you know, I understand that some communities hire someone with the expectation that the, the, the fees they assess will pay for their salary. Is this, is this, do you find this is the case? We've had a hard time this year. Um, it, uh, Um, we're 
aside from the budget that we've presented, we're in the process of re reviewing our fee, our uh, fee structure. And um, if we increase our fees, we're going to have you know we're, there's going to be more revenues. The the uh, um, the uh, I'm sorry, glasses. For that. The, the building inspector, the, the, uh, who's also the code enforcement officer, comes close to paying her own salary. Um, one of the things she also does is take some of the burden off of myself and uh, uh, the assistant commissioner, and we've been able to use that time um, uh, to take on Williamsburg. I mean, essentially, the trade-off was when we took on Williamsburg, we committed to hiring that, a person for that position. And uh, we'll get an additional, uh, we'll get additional monies from Williamsburg this year because they're going forward with a school project, and we'll be putting, you know, significantly more time into that. Uh, uh, Council of Barks had her hand up. Thank you, um, Louis. On your positions, I remember when Tony was there, and then when Mary Ford was our mayor. And I think Tony could have been running that department. Do you remember? Tony was running the commissioner's office? Yeah. Yeah. Was there also an assistant building commissioner then? Yeah. There were there were two um, there were, there there's always been the commissioner and two inspectors. One of them was part-time prior to that. We didn't identify a position as the assistant commissioner until, um, until I got hired back in uh, 2009 um, because the position is in the city's ordinance. Um, um, it wasn't filled. They were, the department was fortunate to find people who would work for the uh, local inspector's monies. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question about Williamsburg, um, so that's that's a whole territory include for all of our inspectors. For, so um, we don't do the plumbing piece of it. We do and the wiring. We do the wiring now, and and we do the building. We, we've got a um, a uh, contracted arrangement for the building and zoning services, and the wiring services are done on a fee for service basis. Um, and the plumbing and gas inspections are done by, um, you know, they have their own plumbing and gas inspector. Um, can I ask the mayor something? Uh, given the looming problem that Louis is going to have with a, the possibility of trying to attract a, at least a plumbing inspector at a higher rate, is there, is, do you have any plan on mitigating? Should that come to be? We'll certainly uh, take a look at it with our HR department and take a look at the, you know, class, that issue. And this is an issue, as you've heard from other departments, um, as we've kept our wages down uh, mm -hmm. in terms of not giving, you know, colas and, and other kinds of increases, it has depressed our wages relative to other communities. So that puts us at a competitive disadvantage at, at some points. Obviously, you know, as the building commissioner argues, I would argue that working in Northampton is, you know, <laughs> has its own <laughs> intrinsic value. Uh, but at the same point, you know, it, it does become an issue when we when you lose somebody who's walking out the door with 30 years of experience and knowledge, um, and then trying to attract people that that. Uh, that could bring that same skill level. So it's something we'll have to be working through with HR, not only with Mr. Um, Hasbrook's department, but also with other departments that face similar uh, retirements and, and loss of personnel. Yeah, I mean, I mean, clearly the the wage skill that's being offered here is about journeyman license level, and what we are asking for, what we're asking for in plumbing, not, 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 not even much higher. Than that. It's not and of course, not even that. I've been out of the loop for a while. So, <laughs> so, 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 so and the other so thing that I want to add, it's about sixty percent of really, yeah. which is similar to what you heard from other departments, right. and I'm sure he can attest to this. Is the this does not prevent the state from <laughs> revising the code every year and putting more complexity into the code and adding all kinds of you know, and so making it even harder to enforce 
um, without any kind of support at the local, you know, supporting the local level. So in, in we, addition we're, to we're essentially the enforcement arm of the state. Right. Um, these aren't local codes we're enforcing. We're, we're he's a sworn officer for the state enforcing right. their codes, which they change uh, all the time. And Preciously. Yeah. And the, I, the, and also the prospect. I mean, what we're pushing for all the all the various zone changes that we uh, we ashed through recently. Uh, with well, the whole idea was the incentive for more growth and more development. You're you're projecting out forty five million dollars for this year. Um, I remember hearing some rather fantastic estimates when the chamber was testifying uh, about the prospects that that, that you know, you'd be looking at two hundred fifty million dollar projects and. Um, <laughs> And so it would seem to me that it would be it would be imperative to have a staff to be able to do the the proper proper inspection services for these things. Councilor Lubarch. Yes, and Louis, on, I know you're on 24 hours a day, correct? On call, and that is now split with your assisting Charles commissioner. So that's a lot of help because it I is, remember that's, one time. That's uh, yeah, I, I, have, I truly don't understand how Tony Cotillo did it. I, I know. He did it all by himself. Found on the lottery. I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> yeah. But, um, Twice. And um, I, I take a lot of credit for, for finding Chuck Miller, but I also got really lucky in that, in that, you know, people like that don't come along very often. You know, he's, he's, he grew up in Northampton, and he worked hard and now his you know he's at a point in his life where he can uh, feels like he can give back a little those are the sorts of people that we're going to need to find to replace our people but they are out there I mean, certainly they're out there could i ask you what is inspector of wires it's the the formal the the the, the, the electrical, electrical inspector actually has a state uh a, a statutory um, role called the inspector of wires and a set of duties that are that are uh, laid out in uh, um, in mass law and so and I'm trying hard to sort of present it as as his role as opposed to the electrical inspector because you know he, he has he ha it's not just to go out and look at what somebody did, but the responsibility for all the wires in town. I um, I I like I'm responsible for all the buildings in town. <laughs> so thank you, thank you for everything that you do, and um, I have to say I really keep you busy on my ward, and I know that, and I appreciate you doing what you've done. Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Any, any other questions for Louis? No. Thank you. Uh, oh, actually, the, oh, I'm sorry. I'd just like to thank you for submitting a level budget. <laughs> and I'll, I'd like to thank you for giving back $300. Right. <laughs> and then some. So, and thank, thank you very much, Louis. I, I, but I will say that if we if if a two hundred and fifty million dollar project hits the desk, I'll be standing here. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Thank you. I, I'd like to say before we adjourn that uh, uh, while she's not going to be testifying, Mayor Majora actually is uh, giving back and is taking a cut in in pay and hours, and that was volunteered and offered by her. And so I think it should be acknowledged. And, and uh, you know, if, if you do it proportionally to the other departments, it's significant. But the, the city council, actually, our, our portion of the budget is, is proportionally reduced magnificently to the Mary's uh, personal sacrifice. So I think you should get credit for that. Um, I would uh, entertain a motion. To move. Second. Anyone second it? All right. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 All opposed? Standing? No one? Thank you all very much.